it's not uh, the parcel coverage, as we've described in the, the staff report, is not one of those issues. Parcel coverage for this site is 60% of the parcel. And the parcel is defined. And the projections are known. And the footprint of the building is known. Um, third point is that there are trees on a property on Wadsworth that could be damaged. And they also referenced a section on the city's sustainable code. Um, I, we requested that the city arborist visit the site just to make an analysis of that tree. Um, there is a large sycamore tree on Wadsworth. Um, it is situated kind of further from where the building will be built. Um, and the arborist's visual inspection of the site did not feel that that tree or the other tree on the Wadsworth parcel would be damaged. As for the sustainable section of the city code, um, what it does allow for is for anyone to bring forth action, not necessarily for the architecture review board to take action on any sustainable uh, section referenced in that code. Um, the additional point is that the curb cut was made without permits for the site. Uh, staff cannot determine when that curb cut was issued, and it is not within the purview of the Architecture Review Board to talk about whether a curb cut was issued correctly or not. It's existing, and it's uh, through the Public Works Department that those permits are issued. The same with the urban runoff. So urban runoff is reviewed at the time of building permit, and it's under Public Works Authority to verify that a new project is compliant with the city standards. And lastly, that the staff report contained material errors, but those errors were not identified specifically. Um, we feel that the development standards are verified and that we will ensure that those standards are adhered to at the time of plan check. So again, this is a de novo hearing, meaning that you are acting as members of the Architecture Review Board, and you have to decide whether or not to approve or deny the previous approval by the board based on the criteria that set forth and the findings. Uh, here are those findings. There's four specific ones. Um, that the project is expressive of good taste. It does not use inferior materials. Uh, it's compatible with developments in the general area. And that it basically complies with the Santa Monica Code. Our recommendation for staff is to make the finding that this project uh, is exempt from CEQA and that the Secretary of Interior standards have been uh, used to consider the design uh, additions and modifications, those standards are two, five, six, and nine, um, to deny the appeal um, and uphold the Architectural Review Board's original approval with findings and conditions, and to approve the statement of official action that's drafted in, in the report. As far as the public notification of this hearing, um, public notices were mailed to property owners and tenants within a 750-foot radius. Um, it, the hearing was published in the Santa Monica Daily Press. Um, the city has received correspondence on the pro project. Three uh, core of those correspondents were in favor, uh, including some of the applicants' correspondence. Two were opposed, including one uh, statement by the appellant, and one was a duplication. And that concludes the report. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I often begin on the right-hand side. Is there anyone on the left-hand side over here who wants to start off? Sure. OK. Sure. Um, staff, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very clear. One thing I do want to clarify with you, when we talk about the encroachments, you said we have, we have a survey. We know the encroachments. We know the building footprint. Will you just clarify for me? that when we're doing the calculation, we are taking out the encroachments 
out of the lot at, as we're, we're considering the encroachment as part of the lot coverage. That's correct, Commissioner Reese. So we have to add that area in green <clears throat> as footprint. And so that takes away from what potentially the, uh, the project at 129 Hart could build. It's added into their total lot coverage calculation. Okay. And then another key component about that was how we define the lot area. And the lot area? Yeah, and you're highlighting the lot area is being defined by a, a survey that's signed by a licensed surveyor. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's my questions for right now. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Lambert. I just have a couple of questions, and they, uh, thank you for the staff report. It was very complete. Um, I, I just want to re-emphasize the lot coverage rule. That's actually in the municipal code, is it not? Yes. 60%? Yes. Do you have that section handy so we can, the owner or the applicant can, uh, it's appellant a rather, can... reference in the one slide. Well, the 60%. It's in the staff report. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, um, and this is maybe a question for Stephanie Moore. Um, was the application submitted by the applicant as complete as we normally require for the ARB? Was there anything missing? Was it different from other applications? No, it was not substantially different. Um, just as in all of the applications, we work with the applicant team to make sure that the submittals are to the ARB's expectations. Okay. And then finally, our purview tonight is, is limited to design issues, right? Yes, you are acting as the Architecture Review Board, design, you. colors, materials. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Tolkien? Um, I thought I heard you said that the fire department has looked at the encroachment and its relationship to the new building. The fire department has not looked at it yet, but it will be considered at time of plan check. Okay. So building and safety and the fire department will look at that area of of close proximity and decide what the standards will be, even maybe more so than the applicant has already provided. I have a question. Just procedurally, and this is a this is a you question, it may also be a Heidi question. Um, when to to what extent does the um, if we're sitting as the ARB, to to what extent does the ARB have authority to um, deal with issues related to construction concerns. There's some back and forth in the in the um, in the materials around this sort of shared sewer thing. And when we sit as planning commission, that's something we would normally ask about and try to get some clarity about, and then you know hang it hand it off to 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 building and safety and public works. But in this case, I'm just not clear on what our so scope is. The materials of the building the colors of the building, the design of the building. That's your focus. Everything else is through the code and through staff's review and building and safety. So if there's an issue that you want to raise that is not colors, design materials, landscaping, we would say that you don't have that purview to make any conditions. OK, thank you. Yeah, so to follow up on that, I. I might have read through the slide quickly, but um, I, I think there was uh, one slide that said that uh, part of the finding number four was, was making sure that the project was consistent with other ordinances. My understanding is that it, it's all other applicable ordinances insofar as the location and appearance of the building and the structures are involved, and not really any ordinance in the whole code, correct? You're talking about the findings for the... Yeah, yeah, the fourth, the fourth finding. This one, number four. Oh yeah, it does say that at the end. Okay. Location. Yeah. Appearance. Got it. And uh, my understanding is that there there is a separate procedure for appealing a, the issuance of a building permit, right? That I do not know. Yeah, there is a procedure through um, to the building uh, and. I think they're building a fire life safety commission. So there is a completely separate procedure through the municipal code right. um, for that. Right. 
Okay. Uh, that's all the questions I've got. Any last questions? Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, I have next that the appellant will make a presentation. And uh, you'll have uh, 15 minutes. And can you remind me, does, does the 15 minute include rebuttal time or should uh, No, so it's 15 minutes of presentation, three minutes in rebuttal. So they're two separate times. Yep. Got it. So okay. we don't need to worry about 15 minutes. It's not going to take anywhere near that. Um, Perfect. I'm Andrew Rice. I'm one of the appellants. The other appellants are here with me, uh, John Campisi and Sue Lynn, who are there. Uh, I live in 125 Heart and 127 Heart, which are on the ocean side of this proposed project. They are in 133 Heart. So we are the neighbors bookending this project. Um, I want to say it was, I learned some things during Gina's uh, presentation, one of which is an issue for us, which is that the primary issues we are concerned about with this project are not materials, color, and whatever the third one is it has to do with accuracy of the survey, footprint, my sewer that's connected. Um, I just want to put that out there. Uh, I also want to say we did not bring this appeal lightly. We really support the idea of remodeling 129 Heart. We are not knee-jerk opposed to anything there. We went to the trouble to meet with the applicant and his architect we spent several hours talking about our concerns, really looking for a path for a project we could support. Um, and then we've individually emailed, talked to, met. So this isn't just some uh, NIMBY appeal trying to put the brakes on a project. I want to make that very clear. Uh, I'm going to, based on things I've learned tonight and today, I'm going to skip over some of these slides because they actually have to do a lot with the ordinance. I will also say that one of our key issues and the reason we brought this appeal is that initially I'm the person who raised the issue of the encroachment and how it should be accounted for at the ARB. And I was told by staff at the time and the applicant that square footage, that building that sits on this lot, it doesn't get accounted for. It doesn't get netted out. Um, that's just, it's just no man's land. And as it turns out, that's not true because I heard staff today say that it's being accounted for and I noticed that in their revised plan, the applicant has changed their calculation. Now, as the appellants, we would love help understanding how that cal calculation changed and what the code is underlying it. I'm gonna actually find myself in my slides really quick, if I may. So these are our reasons for appeal. Uh, they were summarized in both my letter and, and in the staff report. Largely, they come down to the square footage of the encroachment wasn't properly accounted for. Um, we also believe there's an issue with the survey. So staff said, oh, we have a survey and it's signed by a licensed surveyor. Um, it's in the applicant's package and I have a copy for it here. It, says on it, it is a topo survey. It is not a boundary survey. And in the citation, it says the survey relies on records, meaning city records, for the boundaries and locations of things. So the 127 heart structure that encroaches, that's based on your records, not the survey. The location of the as-builts of the structure that's built on city records, not the survey. Um, we would very much like there to be a proper survey, a boundary survey, to determine where that property line is, how many square feet the encroachment actually is, and where the as-built end of 127 Hart and beginning of 129 Hart are, because that affects the setbacks. And that's very important for our quality of life and safety and other issues. Um, I hope that's something that the Planning Commission can deal with. Um, in the hearing and in the package submitted to the ARB, the location of 127 Heart and its boundaries was misrepresented, which affected the setback. Another issue, and I hate to even say this, but the applicant accused various neighbors um, in writing, including me, of racism for raising their concerns. And we believe that impacted 
staff and the ARB's views of the neighbors, which led to perhaps not giving the consideration it should to our concerns about the size, the aesthetics, and these issues of accuracy. Um, you know, the last bullet point here is kind of boilerplate. They acted arbitrarily and capriciously, but I, this is really more about the accuracy of the underlying data and explanation of the project. I'm going to actually skip this slide, and we can get to this at the end. So these two slides are in here because when we met with the applicant and we explained that the encroaching area needed to be netted out of their ground floor area, uh, the response we got was, absolutely not. We will never do that. That's unfair, blah, blah, blah. Now, we see that they've done that, and we saw that today. So we're learning of this today. Uh, as recently as a week ago, we were hearing, we'll never take that square footage out, even though the code requires it. So again, parcel coverage is the ratio of total footprint of all structures on a parcel to the parcel area. We agree. Staff agrees. We would like to see that square footage accurately cat cataloged and accounted for. So we would love some help understanding this. This is the calculation for FAR that was presented at the ARB. It takes a lot area of 3,118 square feet, which for the sake of this discussion, we'll assume it's accurate. It says first floor, 45% of lot area, so 0.45 times 3118 equals 1403. That's the important part. Then you notice they don't net out anything for the encroachment. That's their proposed first floor. This is the citation on the current um, package that you have in front of you. Again, lot area, 3,130 feet per survey. So somehow the lot area has increased by a bit. Um, far, first floor, 50% for R2 zone. It's gone from 0.45 to 0.50. I noticed that Gina said it's 0.6 in her presentation. I'm not an architect. I'm not a land use planner. I'm not a land use attorney. Help me understand what we're basing these calculations on. Um, then they do net out, this time, B there under 7, total encroachment area of adjacent building. That's 127 Heart, which is one of the two duplexes that my family lives in. 1.65.86 square feet. OK, I would like to understand how they arrived at that number. Because that structure is approximately 700 square feet. If you look at the aerial view that Stephanie, I'm sorry, not Stephanie, um, Gina put up, you can see that at least a third and closer to a half of that structure is encroaching. That's not 165 feet, 0.86. So again, what we want is for the law to be upheld. We want an accurate lot size. We want an accurate sense of the encroachment. If it's 100 square feet, great. If it's 300 square feet, great. We just want it to be accounted for and this, this to be done accurately and with transparency and a formula that we can understand what the basis of it is. This is our primary objection that we raised to the ARB. It's not materials or colors. Um, we keep hearing about the survey that was done, and I've seen the survey. And it's a little hard to read, but if you look at the notes, it says, note one, the legal description, boundaries, and easement shown hereon are per record data. That means that, and it also says at the top, topographic survey. It does not say boundary survey. My understanding of a proper boundary survey is that they have to come out with theodolites and do the whole thing from the corner and measure and do really precise location of the boundaries. They don't just go by uh, the county recorder's office or a parcel map that's drawn, no one even knows when, and a property line is drawn under an existing 100-year-old structure. Our request would be that even if you approve this project, um, the Planning Commission condition that a proper survey be done, a proper survey of the lot boundaries, the building boundaries, and the encroachment size be done so it can be properly netted out. This is the photo when I referred to. You can see how much of one, two, seven hard encroaches. Gina's slide was better because she actually outlined it in blue for you. 
but it's a lot. It's close to half of that structure. And I, I measured that structure today on the exterior dimensions. It's 18 feet wide by about 35 or 36 feet long. So that's, you know, we'll just call it 700 square feet. But if that's a third, it's more than 164.8, whatever. Again, I, I hate to even talk about this, but it's come up and it keeps getting raised. And I won't be surprised if it gets raised tonight. Um, in written correspondence with staff, with the um, Santa Monica Conservancy, um, the applicant keeps raising issues claiming that they've been the target of racism on Hart Avenue. And sometimes it's anti-Semitism, sometimes it's anti-Muslim sentiment, sometimes it's about black people. Um, and I just want to say I've lived in that neighborhood for a long time, and I've lived on Hart Avenue for three years. I am of Middle Eastern descent myself. I've never encountered any animus or racial anything like from anyone in that neighborhood. But I just want to specifically address a couple things in here. He says, one neighbor to the west texted me ever since you moved, we are having cockroaches. So I'm the neighbor to the west. I've never texted saying yeah, there are cockroaches. He says, neighbors in the back called health department complaining the rats after they came find nothing. I believe that means he's saying that I called county health claiming there were rats because he owned the property. Well, I did call the county health because there were rats nesting in the shared wall between the house. That's why when you saw those pictures of 127 Heart, the wall was torn up. It was months prior to him purchasing the property, and it has nothing to do with anyone's race. So I just want to address that. I want to say overtly, the applicants, I mean, the appellants that are here, none of us has any issue with the race of the applicant. We welcome the applicant. And I, I, I just think it's, it needed to be addressed. And I do think it may have affected the planning commission or the staff to hear that about the neighborhood. This is, um, I'm going to get into like my personal concerns that are the ones that I believe it was uh, Commissioner Landris spoke of the sewer and things. So this is the schematic of the west elevation showing the house and this nice deck behind it. This is what it really looks like. These houses are attached. They share a wall. Their roofs overlap. I'm very concerned, and again, I don't oppose this construction. I'm very concerned when they demolish that or start working on that. What happens, what happens to my house that I live in? I think it's a valid concern. This is looking straight up. You can see the roofs actually overlap, and again, the two structures are attached. This next slide is my sewer from 127 Hard. It's the horizontal pipe, the yellow house, and the vertical. There, that's 129 Hart. For some reason, that's historical, dating back to the subdivision, my sewage connects to their sewage, which I would love to have changed. That's up to my landlord. Um, I'm concerned that when this project starts, my sewer will be disconnected. So that's it from me. And I want to invite either of my co appellants if they want to say anything. They may have a um, more aesthetic concerns. Again, they live on the other side, and this project is in their view shed. My house is on, on the beach side, so I don't really look that way as much. But, and I'd also welcome any questions. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll <laughs> start with us. Uh, I just have one or two. Yeah. I, I want to be clear. Do you live on the um, east side or the west side? So I live towards the beach, so we'll call that the west side even so you're south. So you're in a two-story White House? No. No. That's, that's the other way. That's, the other side. That's John and Sue Lynn who are here. Um, I'm the one-story yellowish house. I gotcha. With the white rail deck around it. Is 127 uh, vacant? No. My family lives in 125 and 127. Okay. Thank so you. When you look at that overview... Pardon? When you look at that overview of the kind of triplex design, I have the front left house, the back house that overlaps, and then 129 is currently vacant, which is the, right. the applicant's 
Right. I, I just want to assure you, we will ask staff at the end of all this to clarify the survey issues, because I'm not really clear I understand what your issues are. So, and, and what we've done versus what you think we should do. And I, or not, and I, and I appreciate whatever. that very much. Uh, Commissioner Landris. So, thank you. Um, I, we are constrained, right? We've been told what our, what our um, grounds are for this review, but I just I want to ask a couple of questions so I understand um, the broader context. Um, and there's a lot to unpack in, in, in the materials that we've received. Um, so you are the occupant of 125 and 127. Correct. We also have received a letter from somebody saying they represent the owners of the land, registering no objection to what's going on. So one of the questions that I want to ask is, have you um, figured out what your rights are relative to preservation of things like sewage and water and the connections as they relate to your occupancy of the, you know, you, you have a presumably a lease agreement that guarantees you things like sewage, <laughs> right? So I'm just curious if you've, if you are clear on what your rights are under those but circumstances. That's going to be a little bit of a long answer, but yes. And uh, my property that I rent is a rent-controlled duplex. I have Santa Monica rent control rights. I won't go into those, but as you know, right. it's, it's a okay. it's an entitlement essentially right. to rent that no, no, house. No, it's for helpful a long to time. know that it's a rent controlled I, property. I have been in a bit of a struggle with my landlord. I saw Mr. Zalbin's letter um, over habitability issues related to one two seven Heart because there were rats and there was leaking sewage, and I've had to involve the county in that. And I want to say that has nothing to do with Mr. Sadian. That's not other than the fact that my sewage links to his, which I wish it didn't, but you know I'm not accusing Mr. Sadian of any understood bad understood doing there. Yeah. It's just an, it's just a problem for me. What I will say is that um, the applicant and my landlord are locked in a bit of a I'm going to call it litigation. I don't know if they're suing each other. They're locked in a struggle over the location of that property line and who owes whom what. And my landlord did some illegal demolition and got caught by code enforcement for that. And when they went to get permits to do it the right way, we're told you can't get permits because this structure that you're getting permits for sits on his property. And there's been some back and forth that I'm not a party to. But I know my landlord would actually like to complete that construction. And I would very much like for them to complete that construction, which is putting the cl cladding back on and fixing some walls. And I would assume relocating the sewage to the proper, I mean, there is a sewer for one to five heart that's 25 feet away that they could connect it to. Nobody can do anything because they can't get permits because one to seven heart is sitting on one to nine heart, at least those portions are, and a different hand in this structure will not issue permits until that property line dispute is resolved. Again, I don't have a dog in that fight other than it affects my quality of life and the habitability of my home that my family lives in. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't blame Mr. Sadian for that, for what my landlords did. But I would like to see them resolve their disagreement so that my landlord can get a permit so that they can fix things. Okay. Is that, um, is that clarified? Yeah, no, it is clarified. And um, I, I think... Well, I'm going to ask this, and I will ask this of the applicant as well, I suppose. What's with the white van, and why does it matter? Because it's, we've got literally, one of you is right, because you're saying diametrically opposed. Well, I'm going to say this, because I have zero dog in that fight. Okay. I don't, that's not, that's the driveway between 129 and my co-appellants. Okay. Um, they both drive electric cars, I believe a Kia and a Tesla, and they do not own a white van my appellant colleagues. So it's not their van, and it's been parked there a lot. And I've seen, um, I believe, Tyler, who's sitting there, who lived in 129 Heart, who is the appellant's, I'm sorry, the applicant's son, with keys to that van, and it's currently parked in that driveway. Thank you. Any other questions? Not for me. OK. So I'm uh, done, Any right? questions on the side? 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we're going to hear now from the project applicants. If they have a representative here. I, I'm sorry, that's the end of our time. Okay. Rebuttal. Be you'll, you'll, have, you'll have time in rebuttal. Okay. Good evening. My name is Bahram Badi, and I'm the principal uh, architectural firm Badi McLellan. And, oh, you. and, and I, the, I'm sorry if you speak into the microphone for the public record. Sure. You want me to repeat? Yeah. Um, um, my name is Bahram Badi, and I am uh, the principal for the architectural firm McClellan Badi and Associates, and I am the designer and the architect for the project. And my client, Mr. Sadian, is sitting there, and I'm here to just make some clarifications of. Uh, Go ahead, I'm just going to raise the podium oh, for you. Yes. <laughs> if, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, if you could maybe pause the timer well. As high as it goes? Before, I'm sorry. Yeah. Before I pop my back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that as high as it goes? Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there a stool he could Yeah, thank, thanks for bearing with us. We just want to make sure that uh, everything you say is uh, 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 preserved for the record. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and uh, we have been very fortunate to be a part of this project because the project is a historic building and getting a chance of doing a project for a historic building of this nature is rare. So we consider ourselves very fortunate to be in this situation actually. And we enjoyed every second of it. And we will do until it gets done and completed. I'm here to also answer some of the questions and the issues that were raised just uh, here. Um, there were several issues that came up. One was um, the issue relevant to the sewer. And of course, that is something that I know my client has been working with, Mr. Zelman, the owner of 127, 125. And they are in full agreement that they will resolve that issue to the satisfaction of all involved. Because obviously you cannot leave a building without a sewer. But has it, what it has to happen would be very minor. And the way the connection is going to take place is also very straightforward. So they will be able to separate the sewers from each other. So one can belong to the 129. The second item was the area and the FAR that was the subject that Mr. Rice brought up. Originally, when I checked, because I did another project, almost four houses to the east on 157 Hart, for also Mr. Sadian, we had a 45% limitation on our area for the first floor and the second floor 90% of the 45%. And that's how that project was materialized, uh, completed. On this one, the zone, I, I followed the same issue and I presented it. However, the zone on this property, given that whole area is different, it is an R2 zone, and therefore it allows 50%, not a 45%. So initially, we calculated less of the allowable area, and we designed it on that basis. And I have to say, Mr. Rice was correct. I responded to him that I don't believe that encroachment that belongs to another property should be counted against him. That was my probably error. However, I later on when I spoke to Gina, Stephanie, we have looked at the zone, and therefore we went ahead and corrected the square footage. That did not change the R building square footage, because when you look at the limitation, even after we added the amount of the square footage of encroachment, 
we still were within the limits allowed for the first floor, and we are way below the requirements for the second floor because of the 30-foot setback and maintaining the existing roof. So that question, I think, came up, and I think it was obviously, at some point, I looked at the 45% when I should have looked at it at the 50%, and that was an issue. We are also below the limited height. The maximum height for us is at 30 feet. We are at 27 because of the proportions and everything that we worked out for the project. It allowed it to be lower in order to maintain the prominence of the first floor, which is the original structure. The issues relevant to the survey, um, the surveyor that I introduced to the job and we worked with is very reputable. His methods of presenting land surveys have been always used. His methodology is not different than many or almost any other surveyor. He's a licensed surveyor, and he knows how to prepare the property line. I specifically asked that firm to measure the square footage of the encroachment and we had those numbers verified. So the survey is based on the standards of the industry. His work has always been based on the standards of industries, and I have been working with him now for over 15 years. He has never had issues with any of his surveys being questioned. The only time I have seen this being questioned is in this particular case, which, of course, everyone has the right to question, but I just wanted to mention that. In terms of design, I have to say we already have won two awards for this project, two international awards. And we also won two international awards for three international awards for the 157, which we finished. I myself am the professor in architecture for Los Angeles Community College. And I wrote the entire program for sustainable construction management for the district. And we got it approved through the chancellor's office. And I am teaching it, and it's being taught also by others. We will be doing our best to maintain the sustainability and material preservation. I'm very big on that to try to maintain as much as possible in terms of a repair so we do not lose the original details. So, and even now I am also restoring one of the Irving Guild's project in Pasadena. So that's another historical project that we are very fortunate to be dealing with. But the decisions and the work that was done on the design was not without deep concern on various design issues. It was looked at very carefully, and it was measured and remeasured in order to provide the best possible addition to the project. And that's how I presented it with Stephanie and Regina with the Design Review Board. And I'll be more than happy to answer any question you might have on the design issues or others. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lambert. Um, you've pretty much answered any questions I would have had about the survey. But the, um, the appellant talked about a, a topo survey versus a boundary survey. Can you explain what you think he meant by that? Well, you know, most of the time when we ask for it, the basis of all surveys that come into our work is the ALTA, which is the American Land Title Association. They set the standards. And 
the boundary survey shows the boundaries, meets and bounds based on existing records, based on what is available, and then they will go and verify. So their work has a, uh, uh, you know, some parameter that is the start. And then they verify the points, they verify the length. That's how they will be able to, if you notice, all the property lines on a survey ha shows an angle. That angle is not arbitrary. That is where they measure in the field. That is it 23 degrees to the north, east, 25 degrees, five minutes to the south. And that is all clearly, that is a very clear indication that that thing has been field measured by the person. They will not take the risk of just copying some information because then they will be responsible to us because we are Im impacting our client. That's one. The topo survey shows the boundaries, but primarily shows the difference of level on the grade as up, down, if there are areas like a catchment, how the, the counter on the lines have worked out, etc. So the difference, really, we do not use just one, like a topo survey or just a boundary survey. The one that we have turned in has everything in it. I mean, the CAD file is available. I can turn it in and you will see the topo is there, the boundaries are there, the points on the corners of the properties are there, the angle calculations are there, all of the information is there. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I think I'd like Commissioner Hamilton first. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Sure. And thank you for giving us some background on the conversation you've had regarding the sewage line. Um, one of the other um, points that was brought up was the fact that the, both of the buildings touch each other and that there are some potential siting issues yes. on the other. Can you walk us through that oh, conversation? I'm so glad you brought it up because I sort of overlooked my own note okay. in here. I was about Great. to talk about it. Great. Uh, in order for us to get through the building department, we have to prove to them that we have observed all the fire rating necessary for all the walls. In this case, because of the encroachment of the existing building, we are looking at two. One, being able to have a viable space with the setbacks from all sides, as well as how we can protect it from adjacency to another building. In this particular case, we selected a certain distance, and it is on the drawing. And we made the walls that faces the property that I believe Mr. Rice is in with a two-hour wall, which means, and there is no opening in that, in that wall, which means if there is a fire on 127, will not impact the 129. And if there is a fire internally on 129, it will not get in that close range to this building. On top of that, the 129 per current code and regulations that we did with the 157 has to be a sprinkler. So that's a measure that the fire department is very comfortable with, and we have to do that. We are doing it for all new constructions because that has become a rule and regulation almost. So in terms of the distances, we looked at what would be a optimum distance to maintain a viable space for Mr. Sadian, but at the same time, we have a space in there that someone can get there, do some repair work, and at the same time, we have a rated wall that is facing that one story section. How do you account for the fact that the eaves t overlap each other and the fire th uh, threat from, from those two structures overlapping? When it comes to that point underneath where the soffit of the, the uh, Mr. Sadian is, we have to make a two hour okay. uh, construction. Whether we add additional studs, with two layers or one layer of cement board and plaster under it. There are a variety of ways that we can do that, and that is possible. 
Okay. And does your scope of work affect in any, well, does it include any work on 127 and 125? Or is that handled separately through the other if property not, owner? We, okay. we, we are only basically uh, working for Mr. Sadian okay. to do the his property. But at the same time, we will be very up on the issue of fire safety. Because I'm pretty sure the building department and the fire department will have additional comments to give us. But we have taken probably the most critical step already by making the wall fire rated and no opening into it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Landers. Get this working. OK, thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to ask you really the same questions that I asked the appellant, because I think it's important in understanding the relationships here. So. Um, as far as the properties really out, this is outside the scope of the strictly design. As far as the party, the property's relationship with the neighbor, um, as far as you're concerned, there is some resolution underway relative to the sewage. I just want to and those those connection issues and the resolution of the encroachment issues. There's and you have a pathway to do that with the city. I think the yes, uh, my my response would be that given the fact that we originally calculated at forty five percent, and then we calculated it now at fifty percent, and we added the encroachment, and that encroachment area was verified by a surveyor, we deducted it, so it basically took away from the area that Mr. Sadian's building could be but we took that already into account. And still, what we have proposed and passed, the design review board, is still below the threshold of what is allowed. So I think that is one of the areas that I'm hoping that it will address uh, Mr. Rice's concern. Because I know uh, the relationship between Mr. Sadian and Mr. Zelvin, the owner from 125, 127, is friendly. And I already have asked them, actually, what is going to happen with the sewer connection? And they already have figured out that that will be done. Because it's also important for when we go through the public work and the plan trick process with the building department, they will verify that you have to have an independent survey. The, I mean, I'm sorry, sewer. You, the sewer for 125 and 127 may join based on the way it has been laid out. But the 129 sewer has to get separated. And I just, I'm going to say this now because I don't, I want it to be in the record in relation to this conversation. But it strikes me as fairly important that as this moves forward, um, whatever, this is beyond our purview, sure. that the permitting issues for both properties be resolved somewhat simultaneously, because I was concerned to hear that there were some issues for them. And now we're talking about what's a process that's going to lead to permits for you. Yes. And I think I just would editorialize that I hope that the planning staff or the ARB staff or whoever needs to work with whomever will help ensure that, to the extent that this gets resolved, that permits are issued appropriately yeah. uh, to enable that to move forward. So then my next question is, uh, I asked it of the, of the applicant, of the appellant, excuse me. So. What's with the white van and why does it matter? That was my error because that car belonged to Mr. Sadian and I didn't know that. Okay. That was my error in the report that I wrote. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? I have a question for you related to, <clears throat> well, first of all, I mean, appreciate your design and the work you did in the house and you put into it. it Thank you. Um, and I appreciate the fact that I'm not hearing anybody saying that the design materials and colors are problematic. What I'm hearing is all this issue re resolves around this, this survey. And you've said a couple of things, and I, I just want to get some clarity on it. One, you were talking about the topo survey, and you were saying that it was done to an industry standard. And you said because there are 
um, degrees on the corners, that in your mind means that they really did verify it because it just it's too much exposure for that civil. That's correct. Or, or the surveyor. But then you went on and talked about how the industry standard is an ALTA survey and how that provides all this information, um, which is a land use consultant. I, I see those all the time, and sure. um, but I see boundary surveys as well and topo surveys. Sure. I guess the, the question that where I'm going is since that is such a key issue, do you have an ALTA survey when he bought the property? Can you submit that to the city? And as part of going through the building permit process, where that will be more germane, are you planning on providing a different survey? We were, thank you for the comments uh, on the architecture and design. Um, we are planning to submit what we have as a survey. That's why we prepared it, because I told Mr. Sadian that there is no way we can go through the plan check process without an appropriate survey, because the city wants to see it. However, I do not know and I do not believe we had an initial survey for the property or both. Was it? We did original. So there is an original survey. To get, if, when you got title, probably. Do you think you know you can get that to to us? Yeah, but that was the one that I sort of got Mohammed to go in and do the survey. Well, that's the one. But there was no other survey when you purchased. Just clarifying, we couldn't get any of that on the record if you wanted to be on the record. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there was no original uh, survey when Mr. Sadian purchased the property. OK, so doesn't really answer my question if you're going to do another one. But I'm going to say that looks to me like a weakness that you might want to consider. We can redo the survey. OK, it's not our purview tonight, I don't, I don't believe. So I, I'm not, I'm, but I'm just highlighting as a. No, I understand that. But I think that we already did. They did it. They come into the site twice. And then they verified the encroachment because I specifically asked the square footage is critical in this. Yeah. Because at some point, there was a discussion about purchasing some of the, the land or selling the land. So the square footage became very critical on the price that, that would have commanded. So we, I trust the survey. However, again, if, I, if you think that that will resolve anything, I will go ahead and redo the survey. But I doubt if there's going to be any different result, because this is a licensed surveyor with years of experience. And you know, the surveyors have a tremendous liability when it comes to properties. OK, well, that, uh, that addresses my concern. I will one, just make a comment that it seems like what you just said was you're more concerned about the accuracy of the survey related to a, a land use issue between the neighbors than you were for designing the building. And I don't know if you meant it that way, but that's how I took that comment. Actually, no, because one of the reasons that I was very concerned about the survey to show exactly the condition that we are in was also for the design. Yeah, because, a very unique position. As yeah, we because you know, you're looking at a distance that you have to maintain from the neighboring building, which is encroaching, as well as the distance on the, on the east side, the setback that you have to have, which in between, you end up having the viable space. And if that space was not viable, there was no way we can work it out. And then there will be some other strategies that have to come to play. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Tolkien, do you have any questions? Uh, I do not have any questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Sure. Uh, you'll come back up for a rebuttal later. But uh, first, we're going to take public comments. Uh, I've got two people who'd like to speak. Uh, we've got Barbara Kaplan and Carol Lemline. Barbara Kaplan. Um, Vice Chair of the Architectural Review Board. Okay. The existing cottage at 129 Hart is being sensitively retained 
and preserved in its original scale and form with the addition appropriately differentiated. The materials are of high quality and colors are appropriate. The second floor addition set back from the front cottage and street view from Hart. The project is respectful and compatible with the neighborhood of potential South Beach Historic District. It is also compliant with the Secretary of the Interior standards. This project is everything one would hope for in a potential historic district. In respect to the existing as-built drawings, there is a condition to the ARB approval asking for verification of these as-builts with accurate photos um, of existing materials and features to be viewed with the staff. So I think it looked like in the presentation that there was more information in the staff presentation than we had originally seen. There were some discrepancies between the design details and, and the... Um, and the existing conditions that we wanted to retain. Now, just for some of you who don't know me, um, I actually served on the Landmarks Commission for 14 years as chair at one point and, um, and bring that expertise to the ARB when we review projects that are on the uh, historic resources inventory. So. Great, thank, thank you. you. And just to clarify, uh, are, you, are you speaking tonight on behalf of the ARB? I, I mean, I understand that. On behalf of the ARB, yes. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Carol Lemline. Thank you, and good evening. I'm speaking as advocacy co-chair of the Santa Monica Conservancy on behalf of its board of directors, focusing, as you would expect, on the preservation aspects of the ARB uh, the review that took place. We have followed this project very closely. We consider it an important historic property, and I was glad to hear that um, Ms. Kaplan takes the same uh, approach. Um, the proposal for rehabilitation and expansion is very consistent with the character and requirements of the surrounding neighborhood and the relevant Secretary of the Interior standards. I hope you've had an opportunity to read our letter describing this in detail. The standards do not require that a historic property is frozen in time. They describe the appropriate ways to restore, rehabilitate, and update to meet today's needs and expectations while maintaining the building's historic presence in the neighborhood. The ARB STOA clearly describes the checkpoints which will occur later in the project, ensuring continued adherence to the standards as well as many of the issues already discussed. And we applaud the planning staff recommendations maintaining the same principles. In sum, they support preservation and rehabilitation of the original home while adding to it in a way that avoids overwhelming the small historic structure, but which is subtly differentiated as new. We urge you to deny the appeal and allow the applicant to proceed ending the slow deterioration that has taken place of this historic home. Thank you. We got a question from Commissioner Lambert. Um, uh, hi, Carol. Um, have you discussed the Mills Act with the applicant and what he would have to do to take advantage of that? Um, I am sure that I was not present, but I am sure that discussion took place. It is, of course, only applicable if the property is designated. I understand. Would a structure of merit count, or it has to be a landmark? No, it can be a structure of merit. It can actually be a contributor to a historic. I thought it was a contributor. No, it's a it's a dis contributor. Oh, but it's not a, a real potential district. Potential contributor okay. to a potential. Potential. District. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I f so we're going to go to rebuttal now. I think we we're going to the applicant rebuttal first. Correct. All right. Uh, the applicant team, you've got three minutes.
Good thing I came back, I forgot my pen. <laughs> uh, I really don't have much to add uh, about what has been said, I really appreciate the fact that we have received the support from the Conservancy and from the ARB on the project. And as I said, this is one of those projects that we would like to see completed, and it will be completed in a manner that everyone will be satisfied. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, to the appellant team, you've got uh, three minutes of rebuttal. Hi, the first thing I actually want to say is thank you all. Um, I've spent a lot of time around deliberative bodies and you guys ask great questions and I feel heard and seen, so thank you. Um, just a couple things I want to ask rhetorically. Uh, the applicant is saying, trust us, we'll resolve this sewer line with the owner of my property. All I know is they've been at war for two years over a boundary dispute and my landlord's been unable to get permits. I don't trust it. I'd like to see some kind of verification or conditioning on that. The other one regarding the survey, uh, Commissioner Rees, thank you for the good questions that you asked. If the survey is so accurate, I don't understand why the lot size changed significantly between the ARB and here. I think you're absolutely right that there needs to be a proper boundary survey or whatever the other survey is. I'm not a professional at that. Um, both of the lot boundaries, property line between them and the actual size of the encroachment. And I would welcome that. Um, I, I just wanted to say, you know, he talked a lot about the surveyor's methodology. I don't think the issue is that the methodology, they came to do a topographic survey of elevations for a construction project. They didn't come to determine property lines. But again, I think the solution is for it to be properly surveyed, the encroachment surveyed, that done with transparency, and this all this all can work out. And honestly, we wouldn't have had to have this hearing if that had been done up front. And again, I just want to thank you. And um, you know, I'm I would like to know what what our further rights are for monitoring this because I don't feel there was transparency ahead of this. But I thank you all. Any questions? Don't don't leave just yet. We've got at least one question. I think. Uh, or not. Uh, Commissioner Reese? More of a comment, I think, which is two comments I had for you. First of all, this is a very emotionally charged issue with people. And I really appreciate the fact that you came up and had such an eloquent presentation and, and kept it based on the facts. So thank you for that. Second, about the survey. Yeah, I mean, there are, I, I'm not saying that survey's wrong. Keep, get, be very clear about that. I, I, what I'm saying is that seems to be where the source of controversy is and potentially an Alta survey or something else might give you more comfort. But I wouldn't put all your eggs in the basket that that's a, a, a bad survey. I just want to make sure that that's clear. Oh, I'm not saying that survey is wrong either. I'm just saying there's numbers that are shifting, and I'd like to see Understood. that. And I'd also like to understand the code that the 0.5 comes from. The staff said 0.6, whatever. They, I'm sure we can answer that question after this yeah. informally. I just want to add, there, it is in the municipal code, point six. Yeah, and, and the section is in the staff report? I didn't see it in the staff report. Well, but she, she can provide you with a section in the code. It's point six. Okay, anyway. You're asking about the municipal code section, the, the, the zoning code section for parcel coverage? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we can, we, I mean, if it's helpful, I can give that right now. Um, that's, uh, so it's actually in the multi-unit. Uh, zone district, and that is nine point. Sorry, I had it open. I just closed it. Um, yeah, it's it's nine point oh eight oh three zero, but it is not the development standards table because this is the South Beach district. There's actually like special standards that are unique only to this district. So it's nine oh eight oh three zero a two, um, and parcel coverage is specifically D. So a two D. And in this, only in this part of the R2 is the parcel coverage 60%. Um, it's 50% everywhere else. For the ground floor? Yes. And for the second floor? It's 60%. So, so, so we have this, we, we do not distinguish between 
building footprint and what have you. Like there's not like first and second floor. It's parcel coverage is 60% for first and second. So it's like total amount and however you distribute that. And then we have um, the appropriate section of the code is actually not floor area. It's parcel coverage. So those are two different concepts in the zoning code. And so there's no... All right, hold on. Uh, do you have more questions for Mr. Rice? Or I do. Okay. Um, yeah, I do actually, but I just want to get the clarity here. Okay. Which is, there is or is not a, a second story step back requirement because there was conversation about no, 50, 60 percent, and then some proportion of the ground floor. I just, I'm not, I'm, I'm not making an argument. I just love to have the clarification on the record of what it so, actually really so is. So, parcel coverage is 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 the maximum parcel coverage is 60 percent. Yes, there there are setback requirements in addition to that. Sorry, I didn't realize that what that's what you're asking. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I. Following on Commissioner Reese, I, I think um, what I'm hearing, and hopefully you feel heard, that again that there is there are constraints here about what our what our lane is, but it strikes me that in your appeal you've raised a number of issues for which there are other venues, um, and so my comment, and it would be my comment to the to the applicant as well, is to ensure that all parties involved are gaining access to those venues and that those venues are responsive to the particular claims that you have, whether it is resolving an encroachment, <laughs> ensuring the sewage division, or um, rest, you know, sort of restoring um, post-demolition and rebuilding, you know, getting the permits that need to be issued in order to actually get to a place where it's all code compliant. And I hope that that will happen for both of you, but I, you raised it with those habitability concerns, and I think they're important. Won't staff be helping him with that? Idea? I hope so. Yeah. Okay. But I want you to hear it okay. from from okay. us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. I ask a question of his. Uh, we don't take questions from. Uh, uh, it's just part of clarification. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Okay. What clarification would you like from me? I'll ask that question. Can you elucidate what those other venues are? Well, it sounded to me like there were. There were questions with building. There's building and safety, the rent control board, and whatever is going to be reviewed in plan check. Okay. Those struck me as the three. Um, step, uh, Jang or Heidi, or those the, those are the three places where they all have to get their stuff together, right? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think I just want to clarify. I mean, that's not a hearing process or something. No. You know, once you're in plan check, that is, um, you know, that is the job of city staff to review. Plans for compliance with the municipal code. Building permits are not issued, you know, until you demonstrate compliance with all aspects of the municipal code. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Commissioner Reese, were you finished with your line of questions? I am now. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much for uh, right, your time you. and for your presentation. Um, all right. It's now uh, upon us to deliberate and. Uh, Commissioner Hamilton, I see has jumped jumped in. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I guess I'll say this has been a great conversation. I think that the issue of venue is important. I think that from an ARB point of view, um, you know, I we we didn't talk a lot about the actual purview of the ARB and what we're actually being asked to do. Um, my understanding, my question. Um, is that this seems that this is really something for building and safety and fire in the plan check process to resolve, period. I, I'm going to move the staff report, um, which is to deny the appeal and uphold the ARB recommendation. Um, that, okay. so, did you second? Well, let me. I wanted, but I wanted to <laughs> move that. I wasn't finished with the sentence. In the spirit that. That is what we have to do tonight. I don't think the matters are resolved. And what I said earlier stands, and what Commissioner Hamilton said stands, which is that there are other venues to resolve the other issues. They are unresolved. They clearly need to be resolved. But for the purpose of tonight's hearing, I think what we have to do is uphold the ARB decision and affirm the CEQA exemption and issue the stow. So if I, can, if I can perhaps rephrase your motion, uh, it is a motion to adopt the findings determining that the proposed project is categorically exempt 
In accordance with CEQA guidelines section 15331, class 31, historical resource rehabilitation as set forth in the environmental review, to deny 23 ENT 0132 and approve the Architectural Review Board application 23 ARB 0113 based on findings in attachment B, and to approve the statement of official action. Those were the very words that came out of my mouth just a moment ago. Perfect. <laughs> I just want to say one, one thing. Um, I want to say that when I saw the rendering of the house, the new house, it looked like it could have been built when that street was first developed. I mean, it really is a beautiful project, and I want to thank you for that. Any further discussion on this point? Yes. Well, well mm -hmm. I do have the discussion of the one discussion I want to say. So there, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because we have heard different lot coverage numbers. We read them. We read three different lot cover no numbers in our material. Tonight, we've heard three different lot cover numbers. The, de the architect has designed this to 0.45. He's designed it to 0.5. He hasn't designed it to 0.6 yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't have said anything. Okay. I, <laughs> all I had to do is listen to the testimony. <laughs> I, I, do want, I do want to say one thing before we vote to the appellants, because something came through, and I think it's really important to say it in the broader context of housing and neighborhoods in Santa Monica. Um, there was an underlying tone of this building looks a bit different from, from many of the other buildings on the street. And there was a discussion that I thought was really interesting coming out of ARB and coming out of con the Conservancy, and Commissioner Lambert just said it just now, which is that, in fact, at the time that the buildings were built, they look different than many of the buildings look today. And the process of historical preservation is acknowledging the diversity and variety that existed, not just the consistency and uniformity that may have emerged in intermediate, intermediary years. So I'm just naming that because I think when we have conversations, um, sometimes there's a tone of neighborhood compatibility or an assumed uniformity. And here, it strikes me that what the ARB was signaling, and I think it's important to affirm, is that there was quite a bit of diversity in the, um, in the earliest days of the neighborhood and in making their decision, which we're upholding, I hope, um, we are affirming that diversity of building style, even within a single historic neighborhood, is a plus and not something to, um, to sort of try to avoid. Should we take a vote? Well, if I could just say one thing. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I hear you. And I, I'm supporting this motion. Um, to the appellants, I, I hear you. Uh, when you have buildings that overlap and uh, encroach like this, it's really difficult to design things in a way that um, brings peace to everyone involved. Uh, and frankly, some of the things you brought up really do give me pause. Uh, and uh, I encourage you to continue to reach out to staff. Uh, you know, there are procedures with respect to uh, appealing and enforcing uh, compliance with the um, uh, building code and building standards, but that's not our purview tonight. Uh, with respect to ARB appeals, our discretion is, is very limited. It's design review. And uh, as far as I've seen, the evidence supports the uh, findings in the STOA tonight. But um, I, I hear you, and um, I encourage you to continue to work, hopefully collaboratively, with uh, the uh, property owners. Um, with that, I think we're ready to vote. Mm -hmm. Commissioner uh, Hamilton? Yes. Commissioner Lambert? Yes. Commissioner Landris? Yes. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Tolkien? Yes. And Chair Raskin? Yes. Passes 6 0. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got another big hearing coming up. I propose we take a seven minute break and come back. Well, that'll bring us back at 7 50. All right. <laughs> Thanks.
All right, all right, folks. We're gonna we're gonna get moving. Actually, maybe let's wait for Jane to get back. All right, folks, we're going to uh, keep the show going. All right, we're going to move on to item 11B on our agenda. This is uh, 2651 Main Street, uh, 23 ENT-0186, a conditional use permit application and compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start with ex parte disclosures, then we're going to do the staff presentation. The uh, applicant will have 15 minutes for presentation. We'll take public comments. Uh, applicant will have rebuttal, and then we will deliberate. Uh, but let's start with ex parte disclosures, and let's just go down the line. Commissioner Fresco, do you have anything? Uh, I have nothing, but just for the record, that one comment we got from someone in the public named Nina wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> I have no disclosures on this. Uh, Commissioner Labor, any uh, ex parte? Uh, no. Um, I think the waffles that met her at a bar are really delicious, um, but I still think that I can judge this case fairly. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Reese? I don't know. I'm a big waffle fan. I might, you might have lost my impartiality. I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry that I even said that. I have nothing to report. And uh, Commissioner Tolkien? Ex Any ex parte? Any ex parte? No. Uh, I received an email from Mark Gorman that's in the record. Uh, aside from that, I'm familiar with the site and location, um, but nothing else to report. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to the presentation. Chair Ruskin, thank you. Um, Gina Sealock here again for um, City Planning, um, presenting the case before you, which is a request for a conditional use permit, ENT, uh, 23 ENT-186, for the location at 2651 Main Street. So the project site is on Main Street. Uh, it's shown in the area, uh, outlined in purple, um, with the star. The, uh, the site is actually two parcels. The area of the lot is 6,750 square feet, and it's zoned neighborhood commercial. The um, parcel that abuts it to the east is zoned residential. It's a, a OP2 residential zone, and there is a common shared property line between the two. Uh, the existing location, so the top photo shows what the building was before construction started. Um, adjacent uses are retail. Um, there's a hotel, a uh, little pink hotel. And across the street, um, the Victorian, uh, which is a venue that has uh, food and uh, 
space for people who rented out parties and uh, weddings, things like that, as well as other retail stores and banks. And the lower uh, image is a rendering of what the site will look like. This is actual photos taken just recently, just so you can see again what's happening. The construction barricade is up, and across the street again is um, primarily the Victorian. Um, also, the Heritage Museum is just to the north. So the reason uh, this request is being made is there is a conditional use permit uh, request to amend the hours of alcohol service. Um, these hours that are being requested with this project are from 7.30 a.m. to 2 a.m. on two nights a week, Friday and Saturday, and from 7.30 a.m. to midnight on Sunday through Thursday. And what you can see in this floor plan is a representation of the outline of the restaurant space, which is less than 5,000 square feet. So what the Planning Commission is considering with the CUP is the compatibility of the adjacent uses in the neighborhood commercial uh, zone on Main Street and the residential zone behind the subject property. Um, the effectiveness of staff's recommendations and conditions to mitigate any potential alcohol-related adverse impacts. And you have the ability to add conditions limiting alcohol sales or business operations. So the difference between a conditional use permit and an alcohol exemption. The applicant has requested a conditional use permit. Um, the reason that the conditional use permit is required is, is, is that it exceeds limitations that we have for a by right alcohol and food service operation, which we call an alcohol exemption. That alcohol exemption uh, has no public hearing. It's approved through staff administratively. Um, the applicant agrees to 22 conditions of approval, and the alcohol service is limited to um, the hours of 8 a.m. to midnight, seven days a week. Uh, with the conditional use permit, an applicant can request to amend any of those 22 conditions. They can amend the hours request, um, operational considerations, and it's incumbent on the Planning Commission in their review of the conditional use permit to uh, make findings make a determination, and potentially add or modify staff's recommended conditions of approval if that's our recommendation. Um, additionally, in this uh, area of the NC, a conditional use permit is required for restaurants over 5,000 square feet. This is the proposed seating plan for the restaurant. Um, just highlighting the areas and the floor plan. So proposed is a total of 211 seats, and that consists of booths, built-in booths, um, bar seats shown in red, um, a counter seat that faces the kitchen, and an area shown in blue of tables and chairs made up of two and four tops. What I've also indicated in this particular slide is the residential uh, use shown in yellow abutting the rear property line. And the uh, recommended uh, buffer that is proposed to have no commercial use within 15 feet of that rear property line. Um, the commission is required and staff has made uh, findings about the alcohol outlet, um, specifically that it would not adversely affect the welfare of the neighborhood and residents in the area. Um, it wouldn't contribute to an undue concentration of alcohol outlets in the area, and that the sales would not be uh, affecting the uh, more sensitive areas of churches, schools, hospitals, playgrounds, parks, um, within a 500-foot radius, and the sale of alcohol will not increase 
traffic congestion or generate a demand for parking. The conditional use permits findings are similar. Um, they're shown here and they have been addressed in the staff report. Um, but the most significant is again the compatibility of the uses and their proximity uh, to the location in the site. So this is a radius map that we typically provide for alcohol service, uh, 500 foot of the subject property. Um, it outlines the uh, areas of residence, the religious institutions, the alcohol outlets within that radius, um, which are listed over on the right. The, the uh, existing alcohol outlets, uh, they're all um, eating places. They're all considered restaurants. And then five of the six have a type 47, which is on sale general. And one uh, restaurant has a type 41, which is only beer and wine. And then one site is no longer operating at the farmer's market on Main Street. So the recommended conditions that we've highlighted in the staff report have to do specifically with the hours of operation. Um, we do have a definition for restaurant and what that allows in terms of entertainment. Uh, we have specifically added a condition about a um, concrete masonry wall of a certain height and a landscape buffer and some specifics on the type of potential landscaping that would be in there. Um, we added an additional condition about outdoor lighting in the proximity of the rear property line, a condition that specifically limits no amplified music or entertainment in the outdoor area. Um, to address potential issues that might come from loading and unloading, uh, staff work with the uh, mobility division and came up with a recommended um, plop, parking, loading, something, something, operations plan. So in that plan, they specifically call out designated uh, areas of loading and one specifically for the city's pickup of trash and recycling. And we also added uh, a typical condition for alcohol outlets is to provide a security plan approved by the Santa Monica PD. So I'd like to highlight the, again, the hours of operation because this is what's being requested. So the difference uh, really is for Friday and Saturday. Again, if they would apply for a different permit, they would be by right allowed to go midnight seven days a week. Um, we did put a limit on the outdoor in case in the future there are any uh, they haven't maximized their square footage. So if that ever were to occur, um, it is listed as a closure of 11 p.m. And we believe these are consistent with the existing alcohol exemptions that are allowed by right, um, except for the Friday and Saturday uh, closure at 2 a.m. And that this is considered a restaurant, so that food will be offered anytime alcohol is being served. Uh, this uh, existing condition has been, um, has been built. The applicant has been issued a building permit for a lot of renovations on the site. And so they have actually built the uh, wall to a little bit higher standard than what was listed in the permit. And um, they will uh, ha they have been made aware that the condition for this uh, this review is for the 15 foot landscape residential buffer between the residential and the commercial property. And lastly, this slide highlights the loading areas that are shown um, on Main Street, and this would be part of a uh, approval that would be issued under uh, building permit revision. 
So as far as the public notification for this particular project, notices were mailed to property owners and tenants within a 750 foot radius. Um, the application was public to, published in the Santa Monica Daily Press. Um, as far as uh, receiving correspondence, we had 19 pieces of correspondence on this project. Um, 12 were in opposition, four in support, and three correcting information that they felt needed to be addressed. Um, as part of the review of this project, the Planning Commission must make a determination on whether or not the project is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Staff is recommending that it is exempt based on Section 15303, Class 3, uh, which is construction of small structures. So our recommendation from staff is for the Planning Commission to make the CEQA exemption to uh, approve the conditional use permit 23 ENT 0186 based on the findings and subject to the conditions and to approve the statement of official action. That concludes the presentation. Great. Uh, I see Commissioner Reese chimed in with a question. Did something you just said about the CEQA sparked an interest to me. You said that it's a class, the, the exemption relates to small construction? Well, it, this is modified. It does relate to the small construction because they have a building permit, but in essence, what we're saying is the alcohol service is exempt because it, it's going to be contained within a restaurant that's a permitted use on the site. And therefore, the exemption is just clarifying that the building is under construction. OK, I just want to make sure it addresses the alcohol use, which seems to be the main use, not a new construction. Yeah, this is, this is a truncated version of what's in the report. And we highlighted a, in that exemption that this is for alcohol service. Okay. Yeah, that's what I read in the staff report. That's why just tonight's comment made me question that. Um, I saw, well, I'll, I'll wait for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fresco. Um, I just have one question. Uh, when we grant an alcohol permit with, even if it, is a standard permit or if it has expanded hours, whatever we approve stays with the property even if the business changes. Isn't that correct? Correct. It's a land use entitlement. It runs with the land. OK, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hamilton. <clears throat> uh, just for uh, some clarification for, our, for myself. So it's a CUP to uh, start serving alcohol at 7.30 in the morning. Um, to continue serving alcohol on Fridays and Saturdays until 2 a.m., but indoors. Yes. And then outdoors, that would still, alcohol service and access to the outdoors would end at 11 p.m. At this moment in time, there's not a proposal to have any outdoor seating, but the maximum square footage is not been used up by this application because we're saying restaurants under 5,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. So if they move two tables and chairs outside, we just want to be sure that it's clear that that square footage is adhered to and that the limitations would never go over 11 o'clock for the okay. evening. So the, the, up, the, the balcony, the little seating area on the second floor would be closed after 11 and then there is no seating area on that upper level. So I'll go back to the seating plan. I thought I saw that. So I thought there in the design there was a little outdoor there balcony. Is. Yeah. Okay. So here you see a floor plan. That is all ground floor. Okay. See this spiral staircase off to the right? That leads to a deck, but there is no seating or commercial use at this time proposed. Okay, so th that deck is just going to be empty. Right now, it's, it's like an overlook. Okay, can you go up there with a uh, beer and after 11 p.m.? No. Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. It's you, 
Okay. There, it's right. you know you're not allowed to walk outside with alcohol in Santa Monica. Okay. You're served at a restaurant. You stay in the restaurant. Okay. All right. And then the outdoor, um, kind of like the to the to the south, that outdoor kind of looks like a seating area, but it's not being utilized right now. Mm -hmm. Given that the restaurant, I think, is like four hundred and. 4,663 square feet. The limitation is 5,000. If they Correct. were to use that outdoor space, they could only use about 337 Correct. square feet of it. To get it up to 5,000. Okay. So in the future, if they wanted to do that, they'd be limited to a, you know just a couple tables. Correct. Okay. Those are all my questions for now. Uh, Commissioner Landers. Um, so just thank you, Gina. Um, it's Gina night. Um, <laughs> um, so just for clarification, there is no bar to us adding a condition saying, saying no above grade um, commercial use period to the CUP. Nothing's stopping us from doing that. As long as you can make the findings that it's consistent with the request for the alcohol service. Yeah. There's no bar. Okay. Um, and if we did that, then they could conceivably expand on the ground floor level within their 370, 37 square feet limitation on their property uh, outside on the ground floor. But we, the decks, anything above the ground floor would be off limits. Correct. And, you know, the spiral staircase, um, I'm not sure that they could ever have seating up there for a restaurant with a spiral staircase like that from a safety standpoint i i don't know building and safety makes those calls okay mm -hmm. okay um and then i'm looking at I'm, I'm this is really sort of also a question of clarity i'm looking at condition in the draft stoa i'm looking at the last sentence of condition 30 condition 31 and condition 32 um which I actually think the last sentence of 30 could go into 31, um, unless there's a, something I'm not understanding. But when we say food, just for clarification, we don't mean a bag of peanuts. We mean ordering a prepared meal from the kitchen. So if they're going to be serving alcohol until 2 AM, they actually have a kitchen that's functioning, not that they're sort of pulling out a piece, like a cookie from a cupboard and saying, this is food that goes with your drink. Yes, that's correct. Uh, a full service kitchen is a full service kitchen, meaning they're going to prepare the meals that are listed um, in their menu and peanuts and crackers and chips don't count. Okay. Is there a reason that we would not want to say kitchen prepared food in condition 32 or kitchen prepared meals in, con in condition 33? Is that redundant? I mean, is it covered elsewhere in the code that we don't need to say it? Uh, Jig has it in front of our cell a little bit. It's, it's, ar it's already covered in 31. The establishment shall maintain a kitchen or food serving in which a variety of food is prepared and cooked on the premises. So I think it's like redundant. It's, it's understood. You have to have a kitchen on site making food. But that doesn't have a time on it. Right. Right? So, yeah, we have a kitchen. It's just closed. No, no, no. The, the, the requirement is that when you are serving alcohol, that food must also be offered. Now, you can't force a customer to eat, obviously, no, no, but no, the food, you know, must be offered from the kitchen. You must be cooking food. Okay. And ABC requires what they call a bona fide eating place, you know, oh, so okay. they do check, like, that's the distinction between a restaurant and a bar. Right, so um, you have to have food offered that is prepared on site in a kitchen um, in order to qualify for the kind of you know license that they're asking for. Because a bar or nightclub license is different than a restaurant alcohol and license. And just in fairness to them, so I understand the law, um, there's nothing stopping them from creating an after midnight menu that is a smaller. You know, it's like not their full menu, but it's right. still prepared food and it's still bona fide mm -hmm. eating alongside the drinking. That's for instance, they could limit the menu. Right. right. They have That's, 50 yeah. choices, they go down to two, 
five, five. ten. Yeah. Yes, but it has to be prepared food. Like the kitchen staff doesn't get to go home at a certain hour. That's what I'm. That's what I'm asking. Okay. Thanks. That's helpful. Uh, Commissioner Tolkien has not spoken yet. Um, I have a question. What's to prevent them from taking that patio and adding a whole bunch of tables and a mobile bar and you watching with seats? What's to prevent them? We have conditions, and if they went beyond those conditions with just recently asking for a permit, that would not be good. They would be under code enforcement, and the city has the ability to revoke permits if the violation is egregious. So they understand the limits of this request, and it, it is incumbent upon them to follow the rules. Uh, Commissioner Reese. Gina, once again, you said something that sparked a question for me. When we were talking about the upper deck and the concern whether people go up there with a drink, and you said at Santa Monica you can't go outside with alcohol. But if they go, but you don't mean that if they start putting 360 square feet of seats in the back, in the back, they're going to serve alcohol back there, right? If if they decide to expand partially the seating area and the staff is overseeing that they have no more than 5,000 square feet, they could potentially have some outdoor seating area. But with alcohol sales. With alcohol service, correct. Okay. Just that's, the that's, deck is out of bounds. That's fine. I just heard you say you couldn't be outside. Never. Right. So, um, great. Well, that's where my concern is related to this project, but we'll talk about that more, I guess, later. Thank you. Back to Commissioner Fresca. She's already um, talked. Oh. I have one other question about uh, in that purple area. Towards the top, there's a door from the kitchen. And is that just like an egress safety door? Or is the, are they allowed to put things back there? Is there going to be noise coming out the back? The, the kitchen? Upper portion near the north, so at the top? No, it's on the ground floor. Oh, that looks like a gate door. Um, no, no, on the top, coming out of the building. It's just egress, yes. and that door will be closed at all times? Well, emergency exits have emergency to be maintained, exits. so yeah. I mean, okay. I still don't understand where that door is. It leads to the purple area in the back? Yes. Yeah. It's It's... Egress. Egress. Okay. I mean, the existing building, you can see the line of the existing building in the middle where the kitchen is. Mm -hmm. That's an existing footprint. Thank you. I, I fumbled the fact that I passed over Commissioner Labor. Forgive That's me okay. For that. It's easy to do. I'm so quiet and retiring. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry about that. I, um, I want to understand and want everyone to understand that the only reason we are here tonight is because of the hours they want to serve alcohol. Correct. Otherwise, this would go just right through staff, and there wouldn't be any of these conditions. Well, there would be conditions, but it wouldn't be before us. So the There'd hours no are the only hearing. operative thing that we're talking about. But does that expand on the whole conditions. idea of serving alcohol and where we serve it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, I also want to make clear to people that we have no control over whether it's parking or not. We're not allowed to require parking, correct? And there is public parking across the street. Yes, there's um, new legislation from the state, uh, right, and in addition, this project had to go through the Coastal Commission, um, and there is not a requirement that they provide on-site parking, and it would be very, very tough to even get into this site, given the constraints right. existing. Um, and I had one more question, which is, shoot, you guys have really thrown me off. Um, <laughs> um, there's housing upstairs. Is the housing unit upstairs? Uh, pro the applicant has proposed building one unit on the second floor. Okay. And God help those people. Um, maybe they're going to live on site. I don't know. Uh, back to like whether they can expand the square of the footage to like 380 or 370 or whatever, whatever it is. Could they go in the back and put an awning over it and that would count? As toward their floor area? The awning is not the question. 
the limitation is the square footage right now of the amount of size of the restaurant. No, I understand that. And it's all got to be in size. It's got to be within walls. It could potentially be outside. The seating plan that they provided right now is all on the inside. Okay. And also, if I read the chart in the staff report correctly, there are no other restaurants slash bars in this area that open early in the morning. In fact, I think the earliest is like noon or 10. So uh, this would be unique in that regard. I mean, that's what the chart says. So. I asked them what the hours that they wanted to proceed with, and that was what they requested. Um, alcohol exemptions, which um, are permitted and approved through staff, uh, begin at 8 a.m. So there's no so other places that I know that would have 7.30. So they can't open at 7.30? Who, if These this guys. was approved, this oh, okay. request, right. okay, it's they just that they're, the they're going to be the only one open at seven thirty serving drinks. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? My question was answered. Uh, Mr. Tolkien, you okay? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going for another question. Okay, go for it. I'm sorry to do this for us tonight, but we're talking about the conditions, specific project conditions are 8 a.m. in the morning. Well, you guys are offering them 8 a.m. We're, we're recommending. Right. And right? they're still looking they for They requested 7, 7.30. 7.30. Okay. Our just, recommendation as staff is 8. Perfectly clear. Thank you. All right, I've just got a few final questions here. Um, uh, Mr. Gorman had submitted a letter in the record talking about unpermitted, well, potentially unpermitted work here. Um, can you speak to whether they were building permits issued and a CDP issued for the work that was shown in that letter? Well, there's no CUP issued. Oh, sorry, I meant CDP, like Coastal Development Permit. Coastal Development. I, I believe they have their Coastal Development Permit or exemption. Okay. And the applicant can address that because this project has been over time started actually 2021. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, building permits, uh, they do have a building permit and they are currently um, a permit is ready to issue for revisions, which hasn't actually been issued, but it's ready to issue. So that just means finalizing and paying the fees for the city. Okay. Yeah, we, we had another project come before us um, at some point in the last year or so involving, uh, I think it was a wireless facility on Main Street that also allegedly had unpermitted work that began before permits were issued. Um, I suppose there's no question there. Um, uh, there's there's no answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> One, one final question. Um, I, I see all the time in these alcohol CUP conditions of approval a limitation on television screens. Yes. Do you know what the genesis of that is and if there's any basis for that? Uh, if you want to go back in time, there's potentially some other projects that I might have worked on that had issues. Um, way, way back. Um, it, it was written in such a way to try to address people who come in to have food and people who come in to watch sports or do other things. Um, I don't want to name the particular place, but uh, that uh, <laughs> condition was added to keep it from being like uh, just TV screens everywhere. And you know, you, you'll go into a lot of places that have a lot of TV screens that don't have a conditional use permit, and I'm sure. It's very fine. They watch soccer games early in the morning, so. But we limited the number of TV screens. So as a request, a conditional use permit request, you could ask for more TV screens. Is there a specific reason you landed on three screens? No. <laughs> no, not at all. OK. Um. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Don't forget, there's also no dancing allowed in Santa right, Monica. Right, right. No dancing. <laughs> yeah. Because that that was one of the key differentiations that staff made about separating a restaurant versus a nightclub. Got it. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we're going to move on to the uh, applicant presentation now. I don't have sports bars. Like exactly. Well, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Can you put 20 of Can you do it? Yeah. Otherwise, I can just minimize it and bring it up. Mm -hmm. Ask him about the wall. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right, good evening, commissioners, city staff, and fellow members of the community. My name is Stephen Summers. I am a land use consultant with Crest Real Estate, presenting on behalf of the applicant for today's project at 2651 Main Street. We've also got Abby Calro with Crest Real Estate, Shen Li with BA Collective, the architects for the project, and Vinny and Mindy. Kenny uh, here with us today. They're the Rest Red Tours who are the, uh, our clients and the applicants for this project. Uh, first, I do just want to say, sort of as an aside, you know, as a land use consultant, I get to work on a lot of projects, but um, as a West Side resident, this is one that I'm particularly excited about and kind of proud to be presenting to the community today. It's something that I think will take what has been a dilapidated and problematic site and turn it into something really exciting for the community, for people like myself and everyone in this room to enjoy for many years to come. Um, Metaretta Bar will be, Santa Monica, will be the new flagship location of uh, their group of restaurants. And it's going to be offering all day dining, including breakfast, lunch, and dinner service. Um, breakfast and lunch are gonna feature familiar favorites, while dinner is going to showcase you know, Asian fusion dishes paired with cocktails. Um, moving on. The specific entitlement request, of course, Gina summarized it quite well, uh, but it seeks approval for sales of beer, wine, and spirits alongside a full-service food menu during the specified hours um, within the proposed 4,663-square-foot restaurant. I do want to note that while our request originally was for 7.30 a.m. start time, uh, we are in agreement with staff's condition that the start time be 8 a.m., seven days a week, and based on that, the operating hours would be, uh, for alcohol sales, would be 8 a.m. to midnight, Sunday through Thursday, and then 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. Um, and as noted previously, I think it's very important to just consider that the 8 a.m. to midnight service would typically be by right. And so really what's brought us here today is that midnight to 2 a.m. Uh, on Friday and Saturday. And I think as a result of that request, what already should have been really positive for the community has the opportunity to get some additional conditions added to really just make it even better for those in the neighborhood and to address some concerns that frankly might exist even if the restaurant was open from, you know, serving alcohol from 8 a.m. to midnight. And we will talk about the rationale for the midnight to 2 a.m. service a little bit later. So the project site, located at 2651 Main Street, uh, located within the neighborhood commercial zone on Main Street, um, which is a busy commercial destination. I'm going to kind of skip through some of these a little quickly to get to the findings because I know Gina already summarized much of this. Uh, but there are six other establishments serving alcohol within the 500-foot radius, all located on Main Street. And these are some of the images that you already saw of the existing conditions. Um, and actually, just before I go past that, it's just really important to note, this is a building or a property that has been out of use for over a decade, dilapidated, uh, subject to vandalism, and you know, people breaking into the property. So this is really, you know, Vindy, uh, Vinny and Mindy are taking an opportunity to, here to invest in the community. This is going to be a major transformation of the property, and I think the area as a result. Speaking of Vinny and Mindy, um, sorry. So Vinny and Mindy have created three distinctive restaurants already uh, with, as part of their family business. Each is a testament to their love of homestyle dishes and handcrafted cocktails. Um, they've described to me that they treat their restaurants as if the customers are in their own living rooms. 
So it's a very personal endeavor, and they truly care about their customers and community. Um, to that end, you can see in some of the support letters, as well as publications and you know, press that has been released online, that you know, these are really beloved restaurants in their community. And the idea is for the Santa Monica location to be the same. Um, I also wanted to note there was some discussion about the residential unit above. Of course, there's no restriction on who lives there long term. Currently, though, Vinnie and Mindy live two blocks from their, um, from their restaurants in Mid Wilshire. Their intent, at least while this is getting up and operational, is to be living in that unit, to be able to really oversee the operations. Uh, Commissioner Lambert, I believe your direct quote was, God help those people. Uh, but in this case, it, it will actually be the people operating the restaurant. Um, so I also want to reiterate that these restaurants and the one that is going to be opening in Santa Monica, they are restaurants. This is not intended in any way to be a bar. Um, the reason that they want the midnight to 2 a.m. service is specifically to create a different type of offering for people who want to go out and socialize at those hours, you know, get together with family and friends, but don't want to go to a bar or don't want to go to you know, maybe a, a less design forward kind of inviting diner type of situation. So they really view this as being a unique place in the community where you can come later on a Friday or Saturday night and hang out with your family or your friends around a table, having a meal, sharing a drink, but not getting rowdy, you know, having the kind of nightlife experience that you might find at other bars in the area that are open at those times. So it's, it's specifically intended to be a different offering. Here you'll see an image of the existing front elevation. I've already mentioned kind of the, the history of the space, the dilapidated condition. Um, here is an image of what is ultimately proposed. I will note, you can see in the upper right, that balcony on the second floor, that is noted specifically on the plans as being a balcony as part of the residential unit. You can't quite see it here. You'll see it in the site plan. It does connect around uh, to the residential unit. And really the idea here, um, I know this is more in the kind of ARB purview, but the idea is for this to be really inviting from the street and engaging for pedestrians that are walking by. Here, an image of the existing uh, courtyard. And here, the proposed interiors of the space. Again, this is going to be an elevated, sophisticated, um, but also really inviting space. Again, somewhere that is supposed to be comfortable to come with your friends and family. A few additional interior renderings. Um, I'm going to just skip past this one. Some examples of the menus at their different restaurants. Um, you know, it's a broad range of fare. Uh, in the morning, you know, they're really famous for their waffles. They're spectacular. Um, but, you know, pretty broad range of fare. Uh, one of their restaurants is Thai restaurant. And, um, you know, I think they'll be kind of bringing those things together in this restaurant offering because it's going to be breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Here's the site plan. Um, this has already been presented, but I, I will note that that note about the upper deck area being for the residential use is included on this plan. The floor plan, um, this does show that there is a capacity of 211 seats. It's worth noting that that's kind of shown as the maximum of the space. It's likely that it will end up being a little bit smaller in terms of the actual number, but for tonight's presentation, we wanted to look at what the maximum might be. This is an item that Gina touched on. I do think this is important. This is the type of condition that wouldn't exist if we weren't here today going for this CUP for extended hours. Condition number five requires uh, that there be no outdoor commercial use within the 15 feet of the rear property line and that an eight foot high CMU solid wall um, be built along the rear property line. I will note it's currently a little bit taller than that. The um, contractor has informed us that the idea is once the landscaping is in that it would ultimately be eight feet tall. Um, and in addition to the wall, there's going to be a 10 foot wide strip that is a landscape buffer. It's going to have trees planted 12 feet on center and hedges that are supposed to be maintained at a minimum height of 16 feet. Uh, and I think that's, you know, a really significant buffer between this property and the adjacent residential use. 
The conditional use permits uh, findings are listed here. I'm going to skip to the next slide, which is the uh, alcohol outlet findings, because those are a little bit more specific to our exact use here, and they cross over with a lot of the CUP findings. Um, the first item, and really the first and third items are the two main ones that I want to touch on. The first is that the proposed alcohol sales will not adversely affect the welfare of neighboring residents in a significant manner. Um, you know, we believe that to be the case for a number of reasons, not limited to the fact that the operations are, as currently designed, inside of the footprint of the building, the interior of the building. Um, but also condition five, as mentioned before, talks about requ or requires the wall and landscaping at the property line. Condition eight notes that live or amplified music or entertainment shall not be permitted outdoors. Condition 24 uh, states that no exterior activity such as trash disposal, disposal of bottles, um, or noise generating trash deliveries or other maintenance can occur outside uh, can occur in the outside area between the hours of 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Again, this is a condition that wouldn't be in place if it weren't for this CUP process today. Similarly, um, condition 25 notes the restaurant shall not have any activity in the courtyard after 11 p.m. And then the, uh, the third finding here, I'll jump to that one, the proposed alcohol sales will not detrimentally affect nearby neighborhoods, considering the distance to residential buildings, churches, schools, hospitals, playgrounds, parks, and existing alcohol outlets. Um, you know, we feel really strongly that as enforced with conditions 23 to 46 and the other ones that I've already mentioned, potential alcohol-related impacts will be minimized. And um, you know, these conditions include restrictions on hours of operation, but also security plans, um, alcohol training for the staff that are working on the site. Um, and ultimately, you know, these as a whole, along with just the objectives of the applicants, should serve to not only avoid this being a detriment to the community, but actually make it a positive. This slide talks about security measures, which will be quite an upgrade from the current condition. Um, there will be mandatory training on how to handle and deter unfor unfortunate situations, uh, security cameras, and also, as I mentioned, the state alcohol training requirements that will be complied with. Um, thank you very much for your time. I do want to just invite Vinny and Mindy up here for just a moment uh, to just make a, a quick comment as well. Hi, everyone. Thank you for everyone's time. Stephen, that was amazing. Um, yeah, so this just gives us a little opportunity to kind of tell everyone who we are. And, you know, who we are, we're a husband and wife team. We, uh, we have a really big focus on food, service, and atmosphere. And what we did at, you know, our three restaurants in the Mid-Wilshire, um, we really want to do it over here. You know, we've, we really feel like we, we add a lot of value to that, that neighborhood. You know, we, it, we always it, bring the community together. Yeah, we bring we always bring the community together. We, we become like a gathering spot for our family, friends. We've seen kids grow from, you know, one years old to seven years old. So it's been a it's been a really good experience, and we feel that we can be that same restaurant here in Main Street and bring Main Street to its potential. You know, and I and I know, I know the main concern is the alcohol till two a.m. But as Stephen noted, we we just want to have, if you're a working professional and you want to go, we want to go on a date night. I don't want to go to Jameson's. I don't want to go to Victorian. I'd like to go to some establishment where we have a glass of wine, pizza, you know, hang out till 12 or 1 and just kind of have like a nice conversation. But we're excited to be part of this revitalization of Main Street and we really believe that we can be a big asset. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we might have some questions for you. Oh. Uh, Commissioner Lambert. Thank you. Um, Blank. Um, you have a met her at the bar and a met him at the bar. How about a met them at the bar? <laughs> Maybe coming soon. So they're all right next to each other. It's all the love story. It's he met me. I, I'm sorry. Can you speak into the microphone for the record? I was just kidding. <laughs> but maybe. I was hey, just kidding. So our, our three restaurant is right next to each other, and we live two blocks away. We love the neighborhood. Okay. We know everyone really well. But, yeah, we're actually building another one across. Um, in terms of the food, if somebody came in, at, when do you stop service? Like one thirty, because they have to be out instead of not yeah, drinking so, anymore after two. So just prefer kitchen. We'll we'll probably do last call like one thirty, and 
if we like him, he will serve until he one forty five. <laughs> but it's you know we got to get the kit, we got to get the kitchen staff out, you know, and but as late as we can. Last call of all the restaurant usually fifteen thirty minutes before closing time, so For we food have and time alcohol. to yes, you know, have them finish their food or drink right. to get them out. If, okay, yeah. thank you. I think uh, Commissioner Reese jumped in here. So I'm excited about your restaurant. I've, I've heard good things about your Midwest, Mid Wilshire projects. And for me, the two o'clock is not the, the hurdle for me. The hurdle is that is that deck, or not the deck, the, the courtyard area. And I, I heard Mr. Summers say that it's not your intention. You know, you, you guys have good intentions for the community, but this runs with the land. So if you guys happen to leave in 10, 15 years, somebody else could pick this up. And I'm concerned Sunday through Thursday allowing that back area open until 11 o'clock. So I'm wondering if you have any way to um, eliminate those concerns for me, right? Because what I'm concerned with is a boisterous, a boisterous voice back there at 1030 on Monday night is going to create problems for the residents in the back. And that goes directly to the finding number one. We have no attention of leaving anywhere like we love mid wilshire and we love the neighborhood and we own a house there and we but we um love santa monica too that's why we want to live up there too it's good for kids we have two kids and we want them to go to school here we have no intention really so and, and also you know we did we did build that wall and we were talking to sound engineers and everything as well so we're going to have trees that go really high and we did build a wall higher than we had to which cost a lot of money and we were you know we were in communication with the neighbor behind as well um i think his name is mark knows his name but anyways we you know so we're, we're taking steps to to mitigate all those concerns for sure and usually our crown it's not you know we have pretty good crown and we never even we serve drink at 8 a.m we don't we never ever ever gonna do bottomless mimosa that's not our crown it's just for you know that what's it called the nurse shift that they get off in the morning and they just want so a we, glass yeah i'm i'm really focused on like after 10 o'clock at not from 10 to 11 sunday through Mon sunday through thursday that's my bigger concern not the morning hours i'm i'm i haven't even really got to the point as long as you don't have tvs and you're not showing soccer games in the morning we're probably okay but it's that 10 to 11 those those during the midweek and you would say, just to make sure we're clear on the concern, you would say 10 to 11 in the outdoor That's space specifically. The only thing I'm concerned about in my in reading sure. through the staff report. I think it's something, if you give us a moment, I mean, we can kind of think about it and sure. maybe come up for rebuttal. I appreciate that. Mention it. Uh, Commissioner Landers, then Commissioner Tolkien. Right. Yeah, I just, or, wanna, I, I just wanted to... I have one concern wait, about... Oh, I'm sorry. And then Tolkien. Okay. Um, so... I, I appreciate what you're so I'm um, thinking about what Commissioner Reese just asked, but I, I'm curious as you're thinking about this, um, have you looked at uh, business models of um, similar types of restaurants in the Santa Monica area? Because I'm, I'm very much appreciative of what you want to bring. And what's coming to mind is we need we need more of that in a thoughtful way. I think like Papi Gustative down the road is building a different kind of approach to Main Street on Friday nights. Um, Lunetta on the east side has built a different kind of approach to neighborhood dining. So I'm just curious, like when you think about who your model is, um, for us, as we're thinking about it, um, what what does that look like for you? Like, who are the, what are the you you talked about Jamesons and 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 the Victorian? Like, what who are your positive role, role models in Santa Monica? <laughs> so, so honestly, um, one of one of the restaurants that I love and I and I think their decor is amazing. The food, the service, the owners, the husband's wife, husband and wife as well, is Zinke. Do you guys? Uh huh. Know about yeah, that? sure. So that's that's like a goal of mine to get to Zinke because they have a, a great crowd. Good food, good service. Um, it's family owned. There's never a rowdy crowd there. If you ever go get a drink, glass of rosé, you'll see the owner there all the time, Emmanuel. So that's that's like a goal for us to be like Zinke. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So we, I want to bring that to Main Street. Thank you. 
I'm good. Uh, Commissioner Tolkien. I have one concern. The restaurant looks great. Why are the dumpsters going to be coming out on Main Street, which I think is disruptive to the quality of uh, the street life, even though they may not be coming out when there's a lot of people on the street. You're bypassing that garage with, uh, with all those dumpsters in it. I don't know if, I don't know if there's a smell issue or other things like that. Absolutely. It's a reasonable concern. Unfortunately, with this property, there is really no alternative. There isn't a rear alley where... There's no way to get them out? The there, it has to come out to Main Street. There is no access to a rear alley where they could go out uh, in any other there way. Were a lot of, there are a lot of restaurants on the street. Where do they put their dumpsters? They have the back. They don't put them on the... They're not on Main Street. I think they're not. The ones that are on the west side of Main Street do have an alley behind them. Um, and if they're on the east side and they don't have an alley, I mean, I have to imagine that they are just enclosed within a certain space on the property and then rolled out when the time comes. Well. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Okay. I will note, um, Avi, my colleague was noting that, you know, we've been working with the Resource Recovery and Recycling Division, and they do have requirements for screening the trash enclosure that we are complying with. Uh, Commissioner Fresco, do you have a question? I do. I just have a, a small question. So it is a restaurant where people are hanging around tables and drinking mod moderately and eating lots of good food. So what about the bar? There is an actual bar with bar stools. So is there actually some sort of modest bar crowd too? Or what's the deal with that? Yeah, like um, I was talking about Zinc A. You know, if you ever went to Zinc A, it's, it's, it's a very just chill atmosphere. Everyone's hanging out at the bar, whether it's at the bar and the booth or a seat, it's the same kind of you know, vibe, feel. Mm -hmm. it, it attracts a great crowd. I just want to attract a better crowd than Main Street. Bring it, you know, attract better shopkeeps. You know, just it's just overall good for the neighborhood, I think. So, yeah, it'll be moderately. It's not going to be a rowdy. It's not going to be Jameson's. I, I promise you that. Yeah. I do want to note regarding the, the bar, taking Zinke as an example, um, if you go to Zinke during the day, You'll see people that are sometimes set up there with their laptops, mm -hmm. you know, getting a little bit of work done during the day. And then at night, I'll actually go with my wife. We'll sometimes prefer to sit at the bar because it's a little bit more engaging, right? We're still having a regular dinner, um, you know, and, and a glass of wine perhaps. But it's this engaging experience with the bartender and the restaurant as a whole. Correct. Uh, Commissioner Landers? Yeah, before we... Before we go to public comment or anything, or come back to rebuttal, I actually have a question for me. I'm not sure if it's for you or for staff, but what I'm realizing is, um, what is the eligibility, what will be the eligibility of this site for a parklet? And what would the addition of a parklet mean for this, for an alcohol CUP, if there were one? The, by parklet, I mean if you look at the front of Papi Gustative, or you look at the front of Jameson's, or um, uh, what right next door to it as well, a crudo e nudo. Um, it's that it's that sort of deck that goes into the street, and you have um, public seating, and it's rented from the city, but it functions as additional seating. Oh, oh. And I'm curious about what the implications would be if they ever if this property ever became eligible for a parklet, what that would mean. Yeah. So um, once they're established as a as a as a business, as an existing business, because to be eligible for a parklet, you can't just open a parklet and not right. be a business in Santa Monica, right? That's part of the the first threshold. Um, you know, they certainly could apply just like any other business in the city for sidewalk dining um, and a parklet permit. Um, and you know, there's rules that are established for that program. It goes through review by our public works um, department to ensure that it is safe, um, you know, and it meets the standards for the parklet program. And would that be subject to, like, would they, ha would, would that count as their 337 extra square feet? It, or? It, 
It would not. It is on top of that. Um, that's a policy right. decision of the council as part of the city's economic recovery efforts to support um, outdoor uses in association with existing businesses. So um, the, that outdoor square footage is not counted um, within the floor area limitations for restaurants. Um, you know, they they pay uh, licensing fees to the city for use of public space, obviously, um, but it is not counted towards the uh, restaurant's overall floor area. And it would be subject to the same outdoor outdoor time limits of the CUP that we're considering tonight. Yeah, like if if there is a, uh, what I'll call like a governing permit in place already, it's subject to whatever, you know, whether it's a CUP or an AE. I, I would say throughout coming out of the pandemic, a lot of restaurants just converted over to the alcohol exemption because it was a simpler process and, you know, reasonable conditions. So that's kind of what we've seen across the state. I think we should like something like 90 over, you know, two years or something like that. So, um, you know, that essentially the underlying permit still controls in terms of any operating conditions. Okay, yeah, if you're, if you're saying you're gonna be here indefinitely, then there may be a parklet in your future, so I wanna make sure that we're mindful of that. Yeah. Yeah, we see that, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hamilton. I was gonna say, my, my only real question or concern has to do with what uh, re, uh, Jim, Jim said about just outdoor um, access on that patio and then eventually what I know you want to live in the residence or you'll have another person living in that residence but it's designed in a way that people could eventually over time utilize that upper deck and so um, th that's really where I'm centering my concerns over and then I also would have some questions for, for staff to provide some clarity as well so but I have no further questions. Great. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you, seeing your, your presentation now uh, it certainly illuminates things. I, I didn't, I don't think I quite appreciated the concept when I asked the question about televisions. Uh, <laughs> I imagine you wouldn't want a fourth television in there. No television for us. Yeah. They want people talking to each other. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, sh I share the concerns that. Uh, Commissioner Reese and Commissioner Hamilton are, are saying with respect to the outdoor area. Um, do, you, do you anticipate doing anything other than serving food or alcohol out there, for example, like uh, music or art or events or anything like that? No. Okay. I think that's it for my questions for now. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, we're going to move to public comment and then you'll have time for rebuttal. Thank you. They had yeah. Can I just, may I ask that if you're going to confer about those timings, I was just looking at the times on the um, some of the other restaurants on Main Street. So if I may, I would invite you to consider the 10 p.m. limit, not only in the courtyard, but on any prospective parklet um, Sunday to Thursday. Um, I'm just noticing that some of the other restaurants um, stop serving alcohol at 10 p.m., uh, on Main Street, like the the frontage on Main Street. Yeah. Understood. Thank you. All right, we've got uh, two speakers, uh, Mark Gorman and Jerry Rubin. Uh, Chairman Raskin and Commissioners, thank you. Mark Gorman, Second Street. Um, so the Kinneys are great, and we love them. And we're really looking forward to them being on Main Street. And we're willing to have alcohol sell to midnight every day of the week. It'll be great. And uh, they're going to be great operators. But it's not about the kinneys. You know, uh, it, 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 there's no guarantee that the kinneys actually end up operating this place, or end up operating this building. I mean, six months, nine months ago, it was going to be a retail store. And the problem is, is the CUP goes with the property. And the CUP is long term, and its neighbors are long term. And the problem comes about, about a place that someone didn't want to mention, but I'm not in the staff, so I can mention brick and mortar. So over at Edgemar, there was a very good restaurant, Rock and Wagner. Best intentions in the world. The Planning Commission gave them an alcohol permit, a CUP, to be in there till 2 a.m. 
because they're great people. Years later, 10 years later, to get brick and mortar out of there, it required the city a huge amount of effort. They had, the reason we don't have TVs is because in brick and mortar, they had the whole room full of brick and mortar. They had people doing line dancing on the tables and it couldn't be closed down. Essentially, code enforcement is ineffective. They had to go over there undercover and there was all kinds of problems. It took years to get them out of there. And that's the problem is that uh, we don't, you know, every other restaurant closes on Main Street uh, at, before midnight. None of my neighbors are up at midnight. Is that uh, the people who come out and where the problem is, is the 2 a.m. crowd. Is the people up to midnight, great people, great restaurants. From midnight to 2 a.m., you get a completely different crowd. You get people to come along that are already inebriated. They just uh, not interested in food, they're not interested in drinking. They've already done their drinking somewhere else and they're just out shouting and screaming. If you want to get a lesson, uh, education, you should go out on Main Street at 2 a.m. on a Friday night or a Saturday night. There's a near riot out there. Is there. There's police. The police are out there with their loudspeakers, with their sirens, trying to control it. There are people in the streets. The police have to call for backup. And from 2 a.m. to 2.30, we hear, move over, get out of the road, honk, 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 loop, because the police, are, it's a near riot. I feel sorry for the police. It's uncontrollable. And what's going to happen is, uh, those people are just going to go across the street, right across the street, and they're all over the street, and they're going to go into this place. Now, the Kinneys are great, and in fact, you know, we're going to name a street after them. <laughs> and um, so we're so excited to see them. But they, they, they have no problems, and they are, have the best intentions in the world, but the problem is the long term. Thank, thank you, Mr. Gorman. That's uh, your three minutes. Uh, we do have a question from Commissioner Landers. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Gorman, and thank you for your, your correspondence. Um, I am noticing, because I looked up brick and mortar photos, they are still up on Yelp. Um, and there's a difference, and I'm wondering whether it you know, is relevant to your concerns. Um, brick and mortar, it seems, not only had a non-insulated roof, but um, they, they operated a DJ. They, had, they, they literally advertised a DJ, which meant that they were bringing in a particular kind of crowd. Um, my understanding is, and, if it, and I'm not sure that it does, and if it, perhaps we just deal with it, um, that a DJ-type event would not be permitted based on the STOA as it's drafted. Uh, I don't think it would be. So my question is, you know, are there conditions that could be imposed that would address your concerns without limiting their ability to go to um, to 2 a.m. inside? Uh, my, uh, the neighbor's problem is the ineffectiveness of code enforcement. Is you look at the Victorian, the Victorian is a restaurant, but you'd be pretty hard to find anybody over there eating after, two a, after midnight. And the code enforcement is completely ineffective. You put these restrictions in, but you try and do anything about it. You know. The Victorian has got music blaring at 2 a.m. and you call up and then it, it has no effect. You know, they still operate. They continue to be there. And that's city-owned property, by the way. Um, and, and, you know, the trouble is that we are, we have looked, we've looked at the alcohol exemption, you know, the uh, standard, if you get no permit required, look at those conditions. And we looked at the CUP conditions. And we are willing to give up the CUP, CUP conditions that staff has put in there because it's the two a the midnight to two a.m. crowd is just uncontrollable, and um, and it's and say the Kinneys are great they they have the best intentions okay. in the world, but it's it's the people so, that come out. So the, your answer is no, there is no condition. That, your answer is no, there is no condition that would satisfy your concern. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Gorman. Uh, Jerry Rubin. Well, uh, thank you very much. I thought it was a really comprehensive staff report. And uh, it was good meeting the applicant and what they're intending. They have other restaurants. I, I just live a few blocks away in the Ocean Park area. And uh, I think this is going to be a good addition. Um, 
I think there should be. I, Commissioner uh, Landris was talking about their waffles. I think there should be a requirement that they have stuffed French toast for breakfast. <laughs> I want to see that because that's what I really love. <laughs> and I can't find it anywhere. They, they could call it the Reuben. Oh, wait, yeah. that's something else. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I like the buffer and the more trees. How could anybody not? I think uh, I hear you talking about what's going to happen 15, 20 years from now. I'm more worried about climate change 15, 20 years from now about whether someone's going to take over. Because, but I really think that uh, with the police security and everything and everything going on, that it's going to work out really good and be a great addition for the people that want to come. As far as the TVs, I'm, I think it would be better if you didn't have any TV so people could talk. I, you know, what's the point in someone saying, hey, can you turn the volume up on the TV so I could hear it? And then it gets, I've been in places like that, and it gets whatever to have it a real restaurant. Who needs the TVs? So, but I think it's a place I'd love to go to. And my gosh, hey, is the city council meeting letting out so much after midnight, <laughs> they might need a place to go when they, uh, after uh, hours. So I support it, and I think the staff did a good job in getting some of these uh, things in place that everyone agrees to and uh, see how it works out. Right? Go for it. Thanks, Jerry. I think uh, after city council meetings, they'll be fine coming in at 8 a.m. when it uh, opens up in the morning. Yeah. Um, I just want to follow up to Jerry. Well, uh, is this is discussion or a question for him. Or? Discussion. Well, well uh, I'm not going to ask. Never mind. We're, we're going to bring back the uh, applicants for rebuttal. You can ask them what they want to name after yeah. Jerry. Uh -huh. yeah. Hi again, everyone. Stephen Summers, Crest Real Estate. Um, so I wanted to address a couple of the items that were raised first with respect to uh, you know, Mr. Gorman's comments. I, I think really the, the key point there is the concern that you know, ultimately this won't end up as a restaurant long term uh, under potentially a different operator in the future. There were two key points I wanted to make in response to that. First is regarding condition number 28 in the staff report. That does stipulate that the maximum percentage of overall revenue that can be generated by alcohol sales at this location is 40%. So that really does prohibit this from simply becoming a bar. There is no bar that is limited to 40% of their revenue through alcohol sales. Additionally, I think it's worth noting that the Kinneys actually own this property. This is not a situation where there's a tenant coming in with a landlord and maybe has a little bit more of a precarious situation long term. Um, I know this can't be guaranteed, but I think this is a unique situation where they, it's going to be an owner of the property that is operating on the property. And so in terms of longevity, I think there's you know something to be said there. Um, with respect to Mr. Rubin's comments, the Kinneys have committed to exploring the stuffed French toast. Uh, so we will, <laughs> we, will, uh, we will get back to you on that. Uh, and then I did want to uh, address the, you know, the concern about the outdoors. We understand that. Um, I think at this time, uh, my clients aren't aren't willing to kind of volunteer the 10 p.m. restriction. I think that that, you know, Allowing for some flexibility, and it's only until 11 in the future, is something that they just want to maintain because, look, the reality is, is it's expensive to develop and operate a restaurant, and having that flexibility in the future could become important. Um, and ultimately, that is something that you know, is allowed by right within the city. Uh, so you know, other restaurants could do it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Mr. Landers, I think, has a question. Yeah, OK. So um, I want to try to see if we can get somewhere. Uh, so w would you volunteer? So I'm just going to go in order. Would you volunteer a clear, no above grade commercial use? 
So that's the balcony and the prospective roof deck. I know you've said it's for residential use, but yeah. just I don't know how it, the parcel is divided, but if it's one parcel, can we just be clear that no commercial use above grade? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, great. Not above grade, it's second floor. Second or, yeah, exactly. Um, what about no, out, so I understand the, the concern about 10 p.m. What about a limitation on alcohol service during the week after 10 p.m.? So food, yes, but alcohol, no. In the courtyard and in any prospective parklet. I think it's, like from the parklet, y yes, that's, we, we, we can do that, but it's hard to, you know, provide the, the service and the atmosphere that, that, yeah. that we invest so much money in. Like, it's so much money we're putting in the Main Street that, you know, that 10 to even 10, 11 o'clock is, you know, we're not going to have a loud crowd. We're not. So I just, even if you have a glass of wine and a pizza and we have, you know, we have that big concrete wall with the trees, yeah. you know, we're doing our best to really mitigate and, and to reach out to the community. And we've been in talks to our neighbors as well, so... Okay. It's just hard to, it's just such a big investment. I'll and I'm honest. looking, okay, I hear you. I mean, I, we'll leave it to discussion. I, I mean, just to ask, I'm just sort of putting it to you. And then I'm looking at this condition around live or amplified music or entertainment. Um, I'm wondering if we could make it clear that it would not be permitted indoors after 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday or after midnight, Friday to Saturday, just to like remove the possibility. You're not planning to do this, but again, because this runs with the land, we don't want to bring a DJ, you know, we, we don't want to return to a DJ situation. I have a concern, I, let, me, let me sort of put this to you as a comprehensive thing. Currently the condition says no live or amplified music. Um, I really don't have a problem with unamplified, like a guitar player sitting out in the courtyard. We, we're about to ban that for you, and I think that's kind of ridiculous. So um, some kind of no amplified music or entertainment outdoors at any time, nor indoors after 10 p.m. Sunday to Thursday, or midnight Friday to Saturday. Is that, does that sound? Our, our intentions were, like, I don't want a DJ at all. Right. Um, what about, would you be comfortable um, indoors after 11 and then outdoors after 10, you know? Like Let it, it go till 11 indoors? Yeah, indoors, but then outdoors 10. But I, I don't have any intentions of having any DJ. Oh. I'm, I mean, I'm, I don't have a problem with that. I do want to clarify, I mean, the, the project will have to comply with the noise ordinance in the city as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I did also just want to clarify, when you're talking about amplified music, is that above a certain sort of threshold uh, or on the interior, you know, or is that just kind of your more basic, you know, ambiance music? I, I would say it has to, I mean, I, I defer to the planning manager on how that's framed. I, I'm actually trying to take away the restriction on the music because I think it could be something that you want to play with later on, but I do want to respect the need to keep it really inside and really under control I don't mind a guitar player on the street or a quartet on the street. Like that could be cool and bring life, right. right? Just we don't want it blasted through a, you know, Stratocasters. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with you on that as far as the amplification being the primary problem outdoors. Yeah. Um, I, I think that seems reasonable and already the amplification would be taken care of right. on the outdoors. Uh, on the inside, I would just want to be careful that we're not restricting in those later hours against having some you know, lower level of music that is just always playing yeah. in, in a restaurant. That's why I'm concerned about this condition. Yeah, which so. condition number is it? Can you just point me to it? Um, it is condition number um, 20. Hang on, sorry. It's, it, it reads a little strongly to me. Um, hang on. Condition number eight. It's a ban on outdoor amplification, outdoor. right? So yeah. um, what I'd like to do is leave it allowed indoors, but, but I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to address you know, some of the noise concerns for future um, ownership, which is why we would want to, I mean, indoors, how about not indoors after 11, uh, Sunday to Thursday? I think indoors, you know, the noise ordinance really should take care of kind of the issue of expanding that beyond. And, and generally, a, I mean, a restaurant at pretty much all hours of operation, especially of this size, yeah. you're going to have some low-level 
music playing at all times. Okay, let me let, let me punt this. Then we can. I don't want to keep you up here, and we need to get yeah, to discussion. Let me punt this to the planning staff so that we can let's not have see. DJs and dance, like not have that kind of party thing. But you can always have music that's not audible outside the restaurant. Yeah, let's yeah. let's return to that. Yep. Um, I'm good. Mr. Thank Reese, you. Do you have a question? I was going to ask him what he was. I was asking him yeah. why he was opposed to music indoors, but I think you've clarified what your stance is now. I'm I'm very much for music indoors. I'm trying to avoid the booming building that Mr. Gorman is concerned about in an unintended to okay. unintended future. It was a little unclear ownership. when you first yeah. raised it, so I okay. understand. Now. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Appreciate your uh, response to all these questions. We're going to now uh, deliberate amongst ourselves and try to get some consensus on where we're going to land here. Um, and I think the planning manager might want to say something. So I'm, I'm just listening to the conversation. I just want to clarify a few things. So we did modernize our zoning code with the 2015 update. So we used to have things like you all dancing was prohibited. So like if a customer stood up and decided to wiggle, like, sorry, you know, you're out of compliance, right? So there is like a more reasonable definition of restaurant and particularly restaurants with entertainment. So all restaurants in the city, like whether you serve alcohol or not, they are, they are allowed, like permitted to have entertainment indoors. There are arms around that. So that does include anything from like someone reading poetry or playing a guitar all the way to DJs. So to be clear, DJs are allowed. What is not allowed is like the creation of a dance floor, temporary or otherwise, like zero dance floor is allowed. So restaurants are allowed to play music indoors of any sort, obviously subject to the noise ordinance. The noise ordinance does not distinguish between nice amplified music or really loud amplified music. If you play amplified music, by the code of the noise ordinance, you must have like a double vestibule door to address the sort of like booming building issue that you're talking about so that noise doesn't escape if you have that. With outdoor areas, we are similarly strict because of unfortunately people who kind of abuse that piece, you know, so we've had to kind of say like amplified music is amplified music outdoors and it is simply not allowed. Um, because, you know, how could you contain it? And we've experienced this, unfortunately, throughout the pandemic, where we tried to be, you know, more or less restrictive in that regard. And I would say for the most part, it worked just fine, you know, but it only takes like one or two bad instances to kind of ruin it for everybody. Um, and so, you know, that's why we are very strict about outdoor amplified music, um, because it can get out of hand. So I just want to clarify like what the code actually allows as a baseline. Um, certainly the commission has the discretion to put more restrictions around it because it's here in front of you as a CUP. But you know the code does allow restaurants to have music and the limitations on alcohol service is like 11 p.m. indoors or. So can I just ask a follow up to that? I, I don't like the ban on live outdoor music mm -hmm. um, precisely because I think somebody sitting and playing a guitar Right, without amplification mm -hmm. or play, you know, a little violin or whatever. We have make music day here. I mean, I wouldn't want to take away that flexibility. So, is there room within the? Is there a language that would allow us to let them have live music, unamplified live music outside, until a reasonable hour? Let's say 10 p.m., 11 p.m. Yeah, I um, mean, certainly you can modify condition eight to distinguish between live. And amplified music, okay. you know, and hours on that if you would like. Okay. Um, or if you want to split it up. Like, I think if you just explain the concept of what you want, yeah. <laughs> you know, then we can help draft it. Okay. But Thank I thought you. it'd be helpful you to understand at least, like, what is no, that is super helpful. Right. And that postdates the establishment we were talking about, mm -hmm. which was operating before 2015. So it sounds like we have more guardrails. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, to move this forward, um, what we would need to do to approve this is to um, adopt the findings determining that the proposed project is categorically exempt 
uh, per CEQA uh, sec uh, guideline section 15303C, uh, new construction or conversion as uh, set forth in the environmental review, we would need to approve conditional use permit application number 23ENT-0186 based on the findings attached to the staff report and approve the statement of official action. Um, I understand there might be some interest in modifying some conditions of approval, but uh, to move this forward, is anybody interested in making a motion? Sure. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move it with three. I'm going to try, OK? I'm going to move it with three modifications to the STOA. Um, number one, no uh, upper story or rooftop commercial use of any kind. Um, number two, um, no alcohol service in the parklets after 10 p.m. in a prospective parklet. I don't know how staff wants to word that. Um, after 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday or midnight um, Friday and Saturday. Um, and then delete the word uh, live or so that the ampli so the condition eight reads amplified amplified music or entertainment shall not be permitted outdoors um, after 10 p.m. Sunday to Thursday. Um, or um, no, we don't want amplified. We don't want to be amplified at all, basically. And we want, sorry, amplified music or entertainment shall not be permitted outdoors at any time, nor live music or entertainment um, after 10 PM Sunday to Thursday or midnight Friday and Saturday. So you can have a guitar. I'll second that, but I have to challenge your non-amplified music as a person who lives a block away from okay. somebody who teaches saxophone. I hear it all day long with their students. Oh, yeah, and good point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're just assuming it's going to be that lovely classical right. guitarist with the shaved fingernails. Reveille it, reveille it. Every yeah, night. I um, think that's just not a good idea. So no live music at all outside? Yeah, so I would just leave it as the stoa for that. I, I'm in agreement with that as well. The applicant isn't hasn't requested that. Okay. So... So then we'll leave it. That would be nice, though. I was hoping. I tried. Uh, well, but indoors, it's allowed. So you got to go inside to hear your music. I'll, I'll remind enough. folks that no matter what, the project will be subject to the noise ordinance. That would be my, I mean. Yeah, I wouldn't, yeah. Um, the. I just also wanted to ask staff in neighborhood commercial, are they allowed to have second story commercial uses anyway? Yes. They are? You're allowed to have You're, yeah, upstairs? I mean, OK. I you just can. Um, however, again, you know, because this is a CUP, um, if you want to prohibit right. commercial or restaurant activity on these upper levels, you can. I just wanted to make sure we weren't being duplicative. Uh, all right, hold on. So we've got a motion that was made, uh, seconded. And through that motion and seconding process, we a friendly amendment was to <laughs> made to remove my playing with Condition 8. So, I, so no. the motion has. I'm, you know what? I'm going to make it. I'm going to say that's unfriendly after. I'm going to. You know what? I'm going to say it's unfriendly after 6 p.m. After but 6 p.m. Well, well, yeah. I mean, we can vote on it. I, I think. Why don't we take a straw poll about the outside saxophone? Because they're not going to have a saxophone player All disrupting right, on, their on, Sunday brunch. Okay, but they might have guys, a guitar. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I, okay, I like the, I like that you're taking a straw poll about this. Uh, let's let's put this motion on hold for a second. I think we've tentatively got a motion in a second, but let's figure out this whole outdoor uh, timing thing. So. Um, Sorry, could you reframe rephrase Here's the straw poll? Live music, unamplified live music during the day. That would be my outside. outside D okay, during allowed. the day, what does that mean now? Until the sun goes down. Until the sun goes down. Until during daylight sundown. hours. I think you said 6 p.m. Right? I said 6 p.m., but if you want, whatever you want. 6 p.m. Okay. or daylight hours. Let's take a straw poll on yeah. whether or not folks are okay with non amplified music during the outdoor daylight. area before 6 p.m. Before 6 p.m. I could accept that. Yeah, I could accept that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, frankly, the applicant hasn't brought this up. I'm not sure why we're fighting this, and I'm not. So I'm not. I, 
because I like life. I have better things to do. Because I like music, and I so and I'm and I'm concerned store. about revitalizing Main Street. Get a, like a music store. Okay. Do we have agreement about live music? Yes. Unamplified live music before 6 p.m. I think there are four votes on that side of the room. Thank Mr. You. Tolkien, do you want to lay, weigh in on this live <laughs> vote here? Uh, all right, I'm going to count that as an abstention. I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of the uh, any outdoor music. Um, I think you know it, it's nice, but despite people's best efforts, it never seems to work. Um, okay. Uh, so where do we stand with the motion? We have a motion. Yeah, we have a motion. The motion is as the staff report with the amendment of no upper story or rooftop commercial use, no alcohol in the parklet, prospective parklet, after 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday or midnight um, Friday, Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, and then no amplified music or entertainment at any time but live unamplified music would be allowed before 6 p.m. Outdoors. Outdoors. Outdoors, yeah. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Reese. So I have a question. <clears throat> I mean, again, I started this by saying my big concern was the noise em emanating from that courtyard in the back. Mm -hmm. They are not interested in, in volunteering a reduction in hours. Yet somehow we've triangulated on, well, let's protect Main Street from the noise at 10 o'clock. That's not my concern of 10 o'clock having noise out in, on Main Street. I want Main Street to be active, and I want it to be exciting. I'm worried about the back half of the project. You're talking about the park that doesn't exist? Exactly. Uh -huh. um, so, so again, I'm not sure why <clears throat> we're not focusing on the issue at hand, in my mind at least, which is how to protect the residents in the back. Do you have a friendly amendment? Well, I'm... I'm troubled. I like the ten, I, the 10 idea between Sunday and Thursday. That's what I would really feel comfortable with, and I'd vote for this right now. I'd It'd be friendly to me. I know, but then the guy's telling me, I'm putting a ton of money into this. I, I am trying to revitalize your city. Well, he could go till midnight anyway, if, uh, or 11. I mean, he could just withdraw the application and go to 11. Right, so but why then he doesn't get till two? So it's a trade-off. Right. We got this is this planning commission has lost a ton of leverage over the last five years. We have leverage here. Finally. <laughs> I'm not saying I want to use it. I'm just saying, hey, we finally have some leverage. But. I, I also so, want to say, let's just keep in mind that no matter what is done in this outdoor patio space, it can only can take up 337 square feet. So that's not that much space. And so um, I think that it, it's nearly a moot point, I think, about what is done in the patio, because by the time you put up your sound system, that's about 150 square feet right there. So I think, I mean, I think maybe just as like a procedural thing, I think we should, um, I would be happy to just approve the STOA as is, be in, in, unless the applicant has made a request to make a modification to it. Um, I mean, I like the idea of outdoor music, but as I thought about it on a practical level, um, it is hard to, what this would set precedence, as CUP would set precedence for all of the other CUPs that would come thereafter, and it's harder to, you know, keep that contained. We have a great proprietor here, but we can't reasonably say, well, we don't like you as a proprietor, so we're not going to give you the CUP that we gave these other people with the outdoor, you know, outdoor amplification. So, um, we're not amplifying outdoors at all. Well, in, any kind of live music outdoors, whether it's amplified or not. I think we're making a decision based on the fact that the proprietor in this situation is someone that we we like and want to welcome into Santa Monica, but we don't have that, you know, guarantee for all future applicants that are going to seek to use that as a precedent. Um, so I, I think I'd be more comfortable just approving this. I think they're, I'm, I'm okay with it, you know, going up, up, you know, serving alcohol indoors up to 2 a.m., on two days a week. Uh, so I'm, 
I think we should just move forward with it as is. Well, he already has a motion on the floor. And it was friendly, and it yeah. was seconded. So, okay. so why don't we just vote on your motion? If well, hold, hold on. Uh, Commissioner Reese, I, I mean, it, I, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to what you're saying. You know, are, is there another condition that you want to propose here? Well, I think it comes down to, and, and Commissioner Landers said this is friendly, is it move it to 10 o'clock those four days. But the question is, in my mind now, I'm feeling, you know, are we handcuffing this particular, um, this particular uh, restaurant? And again, we, lo we, we appear to love these folks. We just don't know what's going to happen down the road. That's, and so, so no, I don't have a, a great suggestion right now, and that's why I'm leaning towards Commissioner Hamilton saying, let's just approve the stow as it is at this well, moment. So let me offer a counter. Sure. We've done this before. There's language that exists. Staff can cut and paste. We've got that year or two-year come back and review situation. Let's leave it as is. I feel strongly about the parklet because I was looking at consistency with other parklets on Main Street. And so my language about 10 PM wasn't arbitrary. It was all those other parklets are shutting down at 10 PM with their alcohol service. And so should this one, right? So in terms of not right shifting the balance. Um, but as far as the in the, in the courtyard, let's um, Let's have that review. Let's have that review trigger and see how it goes. See if the wall does what they say it's going to do. Right. And if there are no complaints, then we're good to go. And if there is a complaint, then staff brings it back to us. We say, hey, you know what? It's not working. We're going to shut down alcohol service at 10 p.m. or something else. So that sounds. Good. That sounds. Actually, I like that. Um, I would say that 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 review should be a year after they open the, yes. pat the patio, not a year after they open the restaurant, because maybe they o open the patio until a year and two days. Right. Hi Heidi, we can do that, right? Like, sub that the review gets triggered by the use of the outdoor space. Yes, a, the, the year clock from, runs. a year from opening the outdoor space, Correct. because otherwise there's nothing for you to, um, to be reviewing. Yes. Yes. What about the 2 p.m.? Two AM part since the neighbors are concerned and we think the, the whole, so, whole thing is open to review. Is the restaurants till to, it's in oh the you oh I thought she said the review of so, the outdoor but, space. But but any use of outdoor space would have an eleven PM anyway. So it would be eleven PM and then if eleven PM didn't work out, that's when the review would come to you. So it would not be two two AM under any circumstances, but the okay. but the planning manager can confirm that. That's not what I was saying. Right. Yeah, she's what? talking about the two a.m. Gen, in general. You, in general, you have, to, you have to listen to our. Well, so I think oh, the question is: Would the entirety of this of the CUP come back yeah. for further review a year later? It would, right? Yeah. So okay. we run. You want to write it so that it's uh, in the indoor clock starts running when they open the indoors, and the outdoor clock starts running when they open the outdoors. Well, That's let's, very complicated. Let's just, let's just what set are you it. Afraid the, it's going to happen indoors. I'm not afraid of anything. Nina just raised it. I, I don't want to go there. Well, the neighbors are concerned about indoors. Two, yes. They have. There's a noise. noise all right. Noise. All right. Let's let's. Let, it sounds Should I restate like my motion. It sounds like there's support from at least four folks here for the. Uh, Conditions that you said originally and a comeback and review condition. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll sorry, take, I'll drop the live <laughs> music. They didn't ask for it. Okay. I, I still think if they book out their space for a wedding and somebody starts singing outside, they could get court a enforcement called on them. Uh, all right. I'm going to let <laughs> Commissioner Reese have the last word on this. What I'm going to propose is we give uh, uh, you folks five or ten minutes to maybe. Uh, rework the STOA to give us some language to look at, uh, we can come back and we can vote on uh, this after we actually see what's what's written. Sure. Just, um, and I'm sorry if I've, if I've lost track again. I'm, I'm trying to no, keep up. Yeah, but no um, surprise. I just want to make sure if we're, we're looking at this compliance language, right, the one year after. So what what is the will of the commission at this point? Is it just with respect to outdoor spaces within one year of use of any outdoor space? Till 11 p.m. Till, right. No, I, I think I think the interest is to look at uh, the operations all, the all operational hours. Yeah, I think we need a straw poll on that. Okay. So, you, well, acceptable. So, what you want is like after a year of rest, a year from the the date the restaurant opens, you want to review 
basically the restaurant operations, outdoors and indoors? No, because no. they might not open the outdoors. Let's, let's take a straw poll. Uh, I suppose the question is, uh, option A is, uh, look, is the one-year review only for the outdoor hours, or is the one-year review for all operational hours? All. Oh. So... Can I, well, can I ask a clarifying question? Hold well, on, we're taking, we're taking oh, the straw poll. It's not a discussion of yeah. their piece. Yeah. Mr. Hamilton, uh, all hours or just outdoor hours? I, I'm kind of uncomfortable with the, the premise um, because what it, I mean, essentially what we're doing is we're, we're modifying the, the STOA. The applicant hasn't asked us to modify it, but we're modifying it and then we're in putting a trigger in place a year from now that could put them at risk for the CUP. Correct. We've which done I don't this before like five times. But I yeah, but I just I think that the the planning commission is adding conditions that the applicant hasn't requested, but our conditions are also putting the CUP at risk in one year hence. So that's what I'm uncomfortable with. I think that puts our our proprietor we're trying to protect them and we're trying to help engage or not we're, we're trying to enhance the cup which is something not something they've asked us to do but in enhancing the cup we've jeopardized the cup in a year from now if someone comes back and complains so i yeah i i, I would rather and vote, vote, vote yeah i will okay <laughs> Is it for indoors and outdoors? That's Ellis's That's question. the question. Would, would you want one year review for all operational hours or just the outdoor hours? Just the outdoors. Okay. Just the outdoors for me. Uh, for me, it's all hours. Just the outdoors. Mr. Tolkien? Yes. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's for the outdoors. Just say outdoors, uh, Sam. Say outdoors, it's, Sam. Yeah. After a year, do we review the project for its 2 o'clock closing? Or is it after a year of being in the, the outdoor area at 11 o'clock? Outdoor. Is it? I, I 11 o'clock. Okay. No. All right. So it looks like there's it's the will of the commission that the one-year review will just be for the hours for the outdoor yeah. area. Um, okay. Can I, can I just, uh, I think, yeah. may I, just to Commissioner Hamilton, I, I, because this is an important point, and I respect what you're saying. We have found ourselves in positions like these where we are balancing uh, neighborhood concerns with proprietor concerns. And what we're trying, what we are doing is we're creating an incentive where we're providing the more liberal regime to say, look, you're telling us it's going to work. We're going to let you let it work. And then the way this, just so you understand that it's not, it's not triggered by one complaint. The way it's written is that staff does a review of the complaints that come in and, and makes a determination whether or not the complaints are actually related to the limit that was under debate. So if they get a pile of complaints, of noise complaints between 10 and 11 from a large number of people over a long period of time, they're going to bring it back to us. But if they get a handful of complaints, every one of which is resolved because somebody was having a medical emergency, whatever it is, they're not going to bring it to us because mm -hmm. they're going to make the determination that it was not germane to the concern we had. Mr. May, Lambert? May I say something? Um, we have had uh, a number of dealings with the residents of 2nd Street and their opposition to projects adjacent to them on Main Street. I am extremely uncomfortable of leaving it up to the neighborhood to make complaints and potentially revoke a CUP based on that. Extremely uncomfortable. And so um, I think I withdraw my approval. Well, if it, yeah. Uh, I think, I think we've, we've settled, settled the issue of the review question. Um, for clarity? Uh, yeah. For clarity. Just so we're all on the same page. We're okay. talking about three changes to the draft STOA. Change number one, no above, no upper story or rooftop commercial use. That's, that is an enhancement for Santa Monica for this CUP. Second, no alcohol service in the park if there is a parklet after because that's an extension that's outside the scope of, of the current plan. But we've been told that 
it just sort of happens. So no alcohol in the courtyard, sorry, in the parklet after 10 p.m. Sunday to Thursday or after midnight Friday, Saturday for clarity. Um, and then the third is this review for the outdoor courtyard 10 to 11 question. And that's all that we're opening. Okay, so wait, should we take a straw vote? Or no? uh, no, hold, hold, hold on a right second. Uh, so I think maybe we should come back in a certain amount of time, unless you're ready. Yeah. You have it? Okay. Yeah, uh, can we take a look at it before we vote on it? While, while they're putting that up there, can I just throw one more wrench out there? Sure. When we say no commercial on the upper floor, is it really no commercial we don't want, or is it no restaurant? Because what happens if, she, if they move out of the place and it wants to be used as an office? And an office is quiet. Sure. So I okay. think we should change it from no commercial restaurant. to no restaurant use. Can I, can I propose a tweak on that? Sure. Uh, maybe say no commercial except uses that are accessory to the restaurant use? No. no, no. Because you know what? Um, wait, wait, wait. Hang on. No upper story. Or, wait. Uh, no, let's bring back the commercial because... If you take that out, then we've just taken a housing unit off the market. I don't want to do that. Well, no one's going to live there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I want to leave that. I want to, it's residential above ground. Yeah. Okay. It's fine the way they wrote it. Yeah. Okay, so here is what I think you want. Um, so here's new condition. No upper story or rooftop commercial or restaurant activity shall be permitted. That's new condition. And then amended, amended condition number two. I believe the only addition is with respect to regulating a potential parklet. So if alcoholic beverage sales occur in a parklet, hours are limited to the following, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Sunday to Thursday, 8 a.m. to midnight Friday and Saturday. Do you want to say out, um, sidewalk dining? Is, do you want to, I don't know what the code says for si parklet versus sidewalk dining. So normally sidewalk dining would just follow like whatever this the governing permit is. I guess if you wanted to specify it, you could. I do want to note that you've got like three sets of hours here for indoors, a potential outdoor courtyard thing, and then you've got a parklet sidewalk dining, if that's the intent. Yeah. I think okay. that's the will that's of the commission. Okay. That's fine. In a parklet or... Okay. Yeah. I mean, you could go to 11 p.m. if you want to be consistent. Can I there. ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I am, it really scares me that they are basically subject to the, the neighborhood. Um, and, and there could be some, you know, something going on that we have no control over. So what, what if there were a review and the outside was not copacetic with the neighbors? Only the outside part of the CUP would be revo revised or looked at again or whatever. I don't want the whole thing to be pulled if someone complains about someone screaming well, in the courtyard. That's that's the next part that I don't think we've read yet, no. yeah. right? So I... Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's read so that. So let's talk yeah. about yeah. that. Yeah, so, so I, okay, so we're done with amended condition number two. So here's the new condition. Um, just kind of pulled this from the code. So the... This is about the compliance report. The applicant shall file a compliance report within one year of commencement of operations for use of the restaurant's outdoor space, if any, uh, to review the effective, effectiveness of and level of compliance with the terms and conditions of this conditional use permit. After submittal of the compliance report, staff shall either set the matter for a public hearing, which is noticed in the same manner as the original permit application, or submit the compliance report to the Planning Commission as an information item to enable the Planning Commission to determine whether a public hearing is necessary. Upon review of the compliance report at this public hearing, if any, the Planning Commission may add or revise terms and conditions to the extent necessary to ensure effective conditions. of. So in practical language, if something happened on the outside that was not okay, then there would be, it would come to us or whoever's here, and we would decide whether or not to like, maybe reduce the operating hours to eight or something like that or close it all together, but it wouldn't affect the restaurant. Correct. Okay. That's how I understand yes. it, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. Can I, can I ask one clarifying question? Um, I mean, assuming they are in compliance, do we still have to have a public hearing or... No, so that's why it says, like, we either, it's at, kind of, at the discretion of staff a bit. Like, I think once we received a compliance report of, like, there's been nothing, no complaints, nothing has happened, we've have, we're not aware of anything, then it's really just then um, not, we don't set it for a public hearing, and that's why it's the or and information, because it's just 
to kind of close the loop on this condition, we would submit the compliance report to the commission, just so you're aware. Could, right. Okay. Could I have, could I, I'm hearing Commissioner Lambert, could we add one slight phrase after the word conditional use permit mm -hmm. so that it reads effectiveness of and level of compliance with the terms and conditions of this conditional use permit relative to outdoor evening restaurant yeah, use. That's, okay, that's better. So it's very clear that our the scope of our review is not the whole permit. It's just outdoor evening restaurant use. That seems is that okay? Yeah. And just for the record, we've had many of these in our CUPs, and we've never had, never had something it? come back ever. Well, that's or, good to know. Don't it's be never. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Well, I think that's important for them to hear that. So yes, it is important. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. really for 10 and, years down the road. And <laughs> Commissioner Landers, can or we go back? Or 50 years, sorry. Yes, sir. Can we go back to the above ground use? Yeah. Santa Monica needs affordable units. Mm -hmm. You don't need a market rate unit on mm -hmm. the roof. Mm -hmm. And I just think it just takes away economic value for these guys if it, that they could lease out that as an office space. Okay, I'm not gonna die on that hill. You wanna take out the words commercial or? I, I do want to. You guys want to? Yeah, that's fine. That's a good idea. I'm not gonna die on that hill. Thank you. We're really just trying to avoid disruption to the neighborhood. We're not right, trying to exactly. regulate what's happening and in the building. Yeah. What are you dropping on? We don't want the, we don't want the roof, we don't want the restaurant to move up to the second story. Right. And so we've limited no restaurant use. We started with no commercial use. But if they put a <coughs> office up there, we don't care. Cares. It's quiet. We don't care about right. that. It's only the restaurant okay. use. Okay. Okay. So let's do, let's do this before we. Yeah. All right. Uh, is everybody clear on what we're, what we're voting on then? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. I'll, 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 just, I'll just say for the record, I, I'm going to support the motion, but I, I, I do wish we could have a chance to review the. 2 a.m. hour. I, I, I do think Mr. Gore made a good point about it being a war zone sometimes <laughs> at 2 a.m. But uh, may I just say something quick? Yeah. I remember when I was young, and I was on the rent control board in the 80s, and we would get out of our meetings at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night, and the only places we had to go were La Cabana and the Circle Bar. So I'm really looking forward to. Uh, <laughs> we may have been too rowdy for your restaurant, but it would have been nice to have an option. Actually, if I may, I'd like to add a condition that waffles be available till 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's take a vote. Commissioner Fresco? Yes. Commissioner Hamilton? Yes. Commissioner Lambert? Yes. Commissioner Landris? Yes. Commissioner Reese? You guys came into our kitchen and saw how sausage is made? <laughs> <laughs> I do not want to come into your kitchen and see how it's made. Yes. Commissioner Tolkien? Yes. And Chair, Reed, or Chair, Chair Raskin, sorry. Yes. Passes 7-0. Uh, All right. Thank you very much for... Uh, that, um, all right, um, we are going to skip ahead to uh, planning commissioner discussion items. Um, we have an agenda as item for 14A, uh, the letter that was attached to the agenda, but I, I do want to leave space in the agenda for us to also discuss other future agenda items, and perhaps we can circle back on that after we do our discussion for... Uh, 14A, if that's okay. Is that the letter? That's the letter, yeah. Okay. Um, should I start? Go for it. Um, actually, jo you, you didn't have time probably to look at it, but uh, Josh wrote the first page and I wrote the second page. Um, <laughs> that's not exactly true. Well, it's pretty true. Um, and, and I know that we all got a letter from Michael Soloff this morning, and, and I scanned it, and I went back so I could print it out, and it disappeared. It was very mysterious, um, but I pretty much know what it says. Um, and, and what it says is that basically this is premature and that we should figure out you know, what we're doing before we go forward. And my response is, this is just the first step. I mean, all we're doing is asking city council to ask staff to draft an ordinance. There will be an enormous amount of discussion and debate and policy, da 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 before it goes anywhere. Um, and it's not, this is also not a new idea. I mean, we've had off-site inclusionary requirements for almost 40 years, so it's not. this is a, like 
trailblazing. Um, all this will do will add it to the density bonus program. And then there are all the reasons on the second page um, that we thought that it was important to do this. Um, most importantly, that we don't really have local money anymore to, to do 100% affordable project, projects. We're relying on city-owned property, and that's not going to get us to our RENA goal. So we really need an infusion of developer money. Uh, and the, I'm not even sure how many people are going to use this, to be honest with you. Um, but this would be that. And this could leverage other resources. And whether we allow tax credits or not is so far down the road in terms of discussion that it's not really even worth talking about at this point. Um, and again, this is just a continuation of the AHPP program, which has been in place since the 1990s. Uh, and it just it goes to the density bonus programs. Uh, Commissioner Leiters, I, I see you. I do want to give yeah. Commissioner Hamilton a chance to speak first, uh, given his uh, um, work on the letter. Well, if you want to, no, no pressure. If you don't want to speak now, are you talking? I'm sorry. Yeah, you're addressing me. <laughs> I was just giving you the opportunity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I think the you know the intent of the letter. Our, the, the conversation really originated with you, Leslie, and I think I like the idea of creating a an equally, um, a, you know, a, a second lane for developers that's equally as enticing as AB 1287, um, while allowing them to take advantage of an offsite option um, for the affordable units. I, I'll say that. You know, my, my feeling is ideally um, affordable units are kept on site. Um, I think that's the best probably public policy position we can take. Uh, I think what we're, for a variety of, for a lot of reasons, um, I think it's more fair. I think it's certainly an easier story to tell uh, the public that, you know, uh, affordable units are going to be included in this new development. I also think that, um, you know, I think overall on an equity point of view, it on-site is preferred. I think the concern is that there will no longer be an off-site option in the way that the, um, the city of Santa Monica has organized itself. The, uh, you know, there will no longer be fees that could be then leveraged into other projects that could leverage other state and federal resources, and there would be, uh, at the end of the day, fewer affordable units produced in Santa Monica as a result. And so, you know, given the fact that we're forced to work within this framework, we do have to put forth, um, I think, a uh, an option that allows developers to put affordable units off-site only because of the fees generated from those off-site units and only because our goal is to create as much affordable housing in Santa Monica as we can. Um, I did read Michael's, uh, or I did read the public correspondence, and I do think that, um, you know, per perhaps more, um, more thought, more dialogue is needed before we put something in front of council. This was really just going to be a uh, conversation. So I, I, I'm open to that. Um. I, uh, I saw Commissioner Landers' hand first, then Commissioner Fresco, then Commissioner Tolkien. Um, so I'm, I'm the person who requested the agenda item because we're on a mm -hmm. clock, um, because this is going to council next week. And I want to say a couple of things. Um, I agree with the letter that you all drafted, and I also agree with Mike Soloff. And I think that... Um, a way to do this would be for us to forward this letter to council. I have one tiny little tweak um, because I think we need to spell it out really carefully for council. And I don't want to put staff in the position of having to rewrite this letter before tomorrow morning when it's got to get posted with the rest of the agenda packet. But I do think that we could forward Mike's letter with it saying we received this correspondence and want to make sure it's brought to council's attention. I'm sure he'll send it anyway, sure send it anyway but I want to, he came to, went to the trouble of coming to us last week. Yeah. I think what his letter is, oppose unless amended, I don't think it's, this is bad. It's, this is bad as long as it doesn't cannibalize um, tax credit financing. The one change I would like to suggest, and you may disagree, but because we're making specific recommendations 
on the top of the second to last page, the commission is further recommending that offsite units be very low and low income. Mm -hmm with the exception of one moderate rate manager's unit. Oh, okay. I think you got to okay. spell that out That's because um, otherwise council going to be like, oh, no, 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 there's no moderate, you know, no manager's unit. So I would add that one little, pers that parenthetical to whoever has the doc, but then I'd love to just move this forward okay. and get this on the council's, uh, because our whole goal was to have this letter go with our conformance resolution from last week, and we can't, like, if we slow that, we're going to lose that window, yep. and I want to be respectful of yep. that process. I have uh, some questions. I, I have well, some, I'd like to say something. Well, hold, yeah. hold on. Commissioner Frisco is first. Yeah. Um, so my first question is, if we're allowing developers to put units off-site, why do you think that's going to get us more units? I'll explain it when it's my turn. Okay. And then the other thing I would like to discuss is uh, the whole point of 1287, as I understand it, is that you get that second bonus if you're putting moderate units in because we're feeding the top and the bottom and it's a bell curve and we need to get the middle. So if we're allowing them not to build the moderate and we're just, mm -hmm. then we're not doing that, we're doing something else and we kind of need that too. So those are the two things that I have trouble help me uh i do want to give the authors a chance to respond but uh you might also want to respond to what commissioner tolkien's about to say listen i've made my opinion about 1287 and this is just eradicates inclusionary housing and that's what you know it's a bad idea to have its separated like this. What you're going to end up with is ghettoized low-income housing someplace. May I say something? No, no. Oh, I Jim, OK. Yeah. <laughs> so mine are, mine are a little, di come from a different place, I think. Um, first of all, in, your, in the write-up when we talk about, it's interesting when we talk about parking and how we want to protect parking for low-income families, because we don't really care about parking for anybody else. It's but true. We're, I don't. But I know. So it's it's interesting. I think to be fair, not to mention the fact I've spent a career arguing that affordable projects don't need as much parking, and have shown tons of parking studies. Now um, it's interesting that the executive director of our nonprofit has been very vocal in the opposite direction, but she's the only person I've heard oh. say that. Um, but I'm not going to fall on that sword today. One other thing I'd like, but what I would like to also point out is when we talk about affordable housing projects designed with amenities, I think what we're really talking about is services because of, for market rate projects are incredibly amenitized. They have all kinds of nice amenities for people. What we really want for affordable is services. services right. So I think that amenities has to be changed for services. Okay. I think... You know, again, I'm a little uncomfortable with the parking, but I can I can live with that. And I think, you know, Mr. Soloff's point is we need to have a more thoughtful conversation. Well, we can't have a thoughtful conversation until the council directs right. us to have a conversation. Right. Right. So right. I, I'm pretty sure it's not lost on him that that's the way this, this city works. But I think that's how we have to approach this, is we have to get their permission. Let, let me first respond to Nina's question. Um, so how would this provide create more affordable housing? But well, for one thing, moderate income housing doesn't go into 100% affordable housing projects because there's no leveraging money for it. So it, that would be a drag on the project. Um, if, for example, Community Corp found a site that would accommodate 40 units somewhere, um, but there was only city funding or whatever source of funding for land acquisition and subsidy, such that only 35 units could be built, and they have to fill that gap with the extra five units, that could come from inclusionary units. And whether the developer actually buys into that project and pays for that, pays for that portion of the land or whatever the heck, that would leverage and create more units. Um, but Community Corp only builds buildings that are a certain size. Well, so but forget that maybe it's 50 units or 80 units or 100 units. But it doesn't, there's not enough, there are not enough leveraging resources to maximize the use of that land and build all the affordable units that it could accommodate. So they use some inclusionary units from someone else to fill that gap and the, and the full capacity of the land would be realized and there'd be many more affordable units than just those units in the inclusionary project, in the okay, housing Okay, that project. sounds very 
theoretical, uh, but okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not finished. I'm not finished. Yeah. Let me let me let me finish. Um, I looked at the Arroyo numbers today, and many of you may remember that. And granted, it was a development agreement. Um, it's 63 units. It was a $44 million project. It was very expensive because there was a lot of underground public works things that had to be done in, during the construction. So it was very expensive. So it was $44 million. The developer put in $19 million, which is a lot of money. And the rest of it was tax credits and a little bit of conventional debt. That project would never have been built without tax credits. Never. The developer, there's no way the developer is going to put in $44 million to build that project, $19 million instead. And if you look at the Miramar, you're going to have exactly the same situation. But it wasn't more units than we would have gotten if they had been. That's increased. true. That's a different model. It, it, right. Again, if you have a shortfall on a site because there's not enough money to build the extra 10 units or whatever it would accommodate, the inclusionary units could come in and fill out the project. And so does that happen a lot? I have no idea. I mean, we've never done it. Okay, so uh, it's theoretical. Okay, so, okay, so what so about my second question? About moderate? Yeah. Do you want to respond to that? I, I think that, um, yeah, that, that is a, that's a valid point. Um, the, the units that would be created through AB 1287 would be for higher AMI residential households. Mm. Um, typically, the way that and this, the, the, here, here's the thing, as of today, the projects, the, trip, the typical affordable housing projects that are financed through the federal government and through the state of California skew to the lower income range, okay? Um, and that is because we're trying to address this homeless crisis that we're in. Um, that is uh, not set in stone. Those standards change, so as of today, that's how it is. That's not how, you know, we're already having conversations about, okay, we have built a lot of permanent supportive housing for those at the very lowest end of the income spectrum. We need to start, go back to the way things were done 10 plus years ago where most of the units that were built were for middle, lower to middle income families. So there is a conversation about the pendulum swinging back in the other direction. But as it stands today, yeah, that, you, you, that is a valid point. That may not be what the world looks like in five years from now. Uh, but all right. The, oh, hold on. Well, we have to have discussion. If we just take turns, we're not engaging. We're not, we're not. I, Let me just I, ask I, I, you. I understand. I mean, this, this, is, this, is, this is a conversation that I think could go on for hours. But No, yeah. no. I, I, okay. This no, goes to council. I well, need hold on. to go, understand. Go ahead, Commissioner why this is a good idea. Let me just ask him one more question, please. Okay. So 1287, yeah, they're really big and it's way busting out of our zoning and all that and whatever. But it seems to me like the one thing about it is that it is, in fact, the first step of trying to find a way to fund those moderate housing. And we are, we could be somehow undermining that by incentivizing them to continue doing it the old way where it's only low income and uh, uh, using tax credits, as Michael Soloff points out, uh, instead of using that additional density to actually build something we can't seem to figure out how to get any other way. Uh, so that's yeah. my concern. Let, uh Commissioner Landers, uh, then Commissioner Reese, and then I'm going to jump in after that. Okay. Um, I just really, really, really want to bring us back to the fact that we do not have to solve this tonight on the no, dais. All we are asking council to do is to not kill offside affordable. That is all we are asking council to do. And you have written a great letter to start that conversation. We've heard from one commissioner who's made clear that he opposes offsite. That is his right. Another commissioner who is less comfortable with offsite. That is also his right. But I would like to suggest that we delete the entire first paragraph on page, what is that, page two? So we do not even ask council whether they're very low or low. We don't talk about leveraging resources or property tax exemptions because that actually feeds into, that it begins to address Michael's objections, which are that okay. council ought to start a process that does this and Commissioner Fresco's objections, which are that we not cannibalize 
1287, and then we replaced the word amenities in bullet three with the word services, because I think Commissioner Reese was exactly right, and you, re and you drop the word amenities in the second sentence, so it just says these include, and I think we send that, this is my view, we send that with those two minor changes, which are not hard to make, and we move on. And if council elects to direct uh, an offsite option, then we have all the conversation we want. So I'm actually going to respectfully, because of the hour, I'm going to move that. I'm going to move that we forward this letter with the deletion of the first paragraph on page two, starting with the word the commission is fully recommending, drop it entirely, and replacing the word amenities in the first line of bullet three with the word services, and deleting the word amenities on the second line of That's bullet fine. three. That's, That's, That's okay. my motion. Second. I second it. Thank you. Okay. Can I have just a second to look at it? Yeah. With that in mind? Yeah. <laughs> can, can I make a point? Hold, hold, hold on a second. Commissioner Reese has been waiting for a long time. And your mic's off. But can no, I, can I just on the floor. Can I just make a point? Um, I looked at the SSI numbers and the RAINA numbers today, and we are in very, very bad shape with very low and low-income housing. So we can talk all we want about moderate incomes because it's important, but we are so far short of very low and low, and the SSI projections are delusional. So we're going to have thousands of units of very low and low-income housing that we are not going to produce. So let's study it when it comes back. Okay. All right, Commissioner Reese. I'm going to pass because I've realized it's discussion for when we come back if yeah, we get yeah, it. Yeah. If we get it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to weigh in here. Um, first of all, my, my, my thanks to uh, Josh and Leslie for taking the initiative to, to draft this letter. Um, preliminarily, the council can't take action next Tuesday on any of these proposals, right? This is, this is just... Right. Just directing staff. No, the only thing on their agenda will, will be the actual adoption of the AB 1287 ordinance, just the right. straight adoption of the state law. Right, all right. So uh, this is all a conversation that, as we've seen in the last few minutes, I think deserves much more yes. development and yes. much more to be said. Um, I don't think that this is the time to be giving specific suggestions along the lines of what is in the letter without first having broader community input and feedback. Um, I, I share some of the equity concerns that have been talked about tonight. Uh, what I would feel comfortable signing my name to and passing on to council is a short letter that has a sentence or two that says, uh, we want to uh, begin a community discussion about how we can make this happen. I, They're not going to know what we're talking about, for one thing. I'm just going to... No, you guys no, let, I, guys, let him speak. Okay. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate the desire for specificity, but that needs to be the product of community engagement and community input. I don't think it's the time now to be uh, essentially le legislating this on, on the fly. Uh, so I will make a substitute motion that we uh, submit a letter that says uh, we have engaged in preliminary discussions about um, uh, options for uh, off-site uh, inclusionary units as part of the local density bonus program. And uh, we uh, encourage the city council to uh, start a, or to give direction to staff to uh, engage a community process to explore that. I, I, well, can I speak against that before we sure, move we on? Sure, okay. motion on the floor. But can we bring the letter back up? I know there's a substitute motion on the floor. Are you going to stay right now, write the letter, hold us for an hour for us to send it? We almost didn't forward the AB 1287 uh, resolution because we were unhappy with killing the offsite and we came to an understanding of how to move this forward. There is nothing in this letter that prevents it. If you would like to amend that the sentence to say, the Planning Commission requests that the City Council begin community consultations toward an ordinance to create a local density bonus, I'm totally fine with that. I am not fine with um, holding up this process. It has to go into the agenda packet tomorrow. The will of the commission last week, this week, was that we send this message simultaneously with our resolution. That is why we agendized it for today. I really, honestly, at some level, I don't care what's in the letter, but we're out of time. 
Can I, need to, I, I really need to say something. I am a firm believer in community participation. I know there will be a lot on this. But let's be honest. You have some housing professionals on this commission. And our best thinking and our best direction to, to counsel, they could reject it, is in this letter. And, and, and I am a bit offended that that doesn't seem to resonate. I... <laughs> I, I wouldn't characterize it in that way. I, 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 I don't think now's the time to debate that. I, I, I uh, value the perspective that's in the letter. Uh, I, I think that there needs to be more community input. And frankly, I, the, the letter is going to go to council, and they're not going to take any action on it. Well, they direct staff, or they won't. Yeah. Yeah. But do you want to add a community input line to that first sentence so that it feels? No, I, I don't want. To, I don't want. I don't feel comfortable signing my name onto a letter with uh, recommend these specific recommendations. Well, I, I think if we vote to do it, you're the chair. You're going to sign. <laughs> chair, you're going to transmit it. Like, that's what is involved in being chair of a commission. Hey, he, he can, I, I he can still he say he he's not comfortable. That's right. Yeah. Right. So right. let yeah. let him have his um, piece. Hold on, uh, Commissioner Fresca. I s suggest that we leave it a little more open ended about some of these issues, and that we just send the first three paragraphs, because after that it starts specifying about whether it's affordable or not, and if it's the words tax credits come into it's it. It's the rationale and, for why we want this, which should make a difference. Maybe it won't. Nice. Yeah. If I may, it, it actually appears that perhaps the first paragraph is the most specific about what is being recommended. So the, the sentence that speaks about exactly what the local program be identical to the proposed ordinance, that, that half of that paragraph actually is more prescriptive. The rest of it, it appears to be more of a justification for why the ex exploration needs to occur. So perhaps just striking that language would, mm -hmm. would be helpful. Yes. What language? This right there. OK. Yeah, well, let, let me also say that if, the, and, and I'm, I'm, not being, I'm not being obtuse or nasty about this, um, but I mean it, that if this letter doesn't go to council, I will send it individually. So that's fine. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, that's, 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 your, right. that's your right to do that. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, Commissioner Fresco, did you want to say something else? Uh, so then that would be the only thing we would cut is that red part? Could I, well... In the spirit of getting us through this, well, I would cut the set, the paragraph that starts eligibility for because the we don't need to tell council what's in 1287 because they're about so to get either. a staff report that tells them that. So we don't need to be repetitive there. We right. could drop that. You're right. Yes. Um, we could then drop. Um, Commission is further. We did drop that, and then of the remainder, um, I think. Uh, we could. That's that's the rationale for why we're asking for this. They're going to say, right. "Where did this come from? Why no, are you no, doing I this?" I actually, I actually think that that would would be fine. It would leave what's there, but um, uh, but we're because we're not actually arguing how they should do it. We're just no, telling them why it's important. it's important. But I think I think Heidi was right to drop that first paragraph, and if we drop that explan explanation, it just gets tighter and makes the case and moves on. Um, so, and they're very low and low income. And I do think I respect, with respect to our chair, we should say direct staff to engage the community uh, in the preparation of an ordinance. Um, or to start it themselves, you know, or something like that. I, I do want to give him the, you know, he, he's making an important point, and, and it should reflect his his views about community engagement. But I do think we should vote on this, and we'll see where it goes. Well, are you yeah. getting all this stuff? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, look, she's typing so yeah. fast. Uh, so I, I've put it on the screen. If you, that's. I think I've been following the conversation. Yeah. Uh, look, you know, if there are four votes for this, I'm not. I'm not going to hold this up. My my one uh, request is perhaps that we could replace my name with Santa Monica Planning Commission at the end. With what? Sure. Just Santa Monica Planning Commission. Okay. Yeah. Faceless. Yeah. <laughs> Anonymous. Well, it could be. I don't know. Are there rules of, rules of order about that? 
No. Okay. No. To the extent there are rules of order, the commission may <laughs> vote to overrule it and and place and Thank place you, this Sonia. as the signature rather than the chair. So you are okay. fine. <laughs> Well, why don't we just make, why don't, may I suggest since we're editing on the fly, let's just put it in memo format so that it, so that it's from, it's not dear Mayor Brock, it's to Mayor Brock and it's from Planning Commission. Okay, yeah. And then there's no signature at the end. It's not just him, it's all the other people. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. To Mayor Brock from Planning Commission and then you don't even need to sign it if you don't want to. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's, okay. Any further edits? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> See none. Let's 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 take. I thought he was say Santa Monica. Let's let's <laughs> take Beverly a Hills. let's take a, a let's take a vote on this uh, as as edited here. Um, so is this now your substitute motion? Because that's what's on the floor. Sure. Great. Uh, okay. <laughs> friendly. It's friendly, so it's approved. I mean, I'm voting no on the motion, but okay. go for it. Well, I'm, I'm accepting Ellis's substitute motion as friendly, and Nina seconded it anyway. May so. I ask who's the second All on the substitute changes? motion? Nina was. Uh, okay. Nina. But I accepted it as friendly, so it's okay. now uh, the motion. Whatever. I'm not sure what you did, but you left yeah. the second page out. Right. Yeah. Well, there's a, whatever. I won't read the other parts again. What's, what's Because, <laughs> well, it's just, you know, the, this will do this, and this will. We could say these things could do these things. Because we don't know. Hmm. Can, can we just That's like, okay. go with it? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just do what Leslie wants, everyone. Because if not, she's going to uh, All right. Okay. Okay. We, we've, got I, the, I, we've got the language up there. Let's take a vote. We've got it. Yeah. yeah. So it's still my motion with, Nina, with Nina's Fres second. Fresco was the yeah. second. Oh, okay. okay. And, and to be clear, this is what you're sending. It is a memo to the mayor and council from the planning commission. It's got, we cut out some paragraphs here. Two paragraphs, and then there's a summary of the justification. Okay, great. I don't understand. The, we've been doing this for forty years. We've had an okay. offsite inclusionary program for forty years. Can, so we, why, why is this? No. Okay. Yeah, right, I'm vote. sorry. I'm sorry. And we're going to put the date it's underneath the from. Yeah. To mayor from planning commission date re offsite you density offsite. I can do that right now. Yeah. Re. Yep. yep. Uh, kind of local density. right. Local density bonus program for offsite affordable housing. Perfect. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fresco? Yes. Commissioner Hamilton? Yes. Commissioner Lambert? Yes. Hold on, I'm not sure what it looks like, but I don't care. <laughs> Commissioner Landris? I'm not sure, but Commissioner Landris votes yes. Commissioner Rees? I know what this says, and I'm saying yes. Commissioner Tolkien? No. And Chair Raskin? No. 5-2, uh, OK. Uh, OK, so in terms of logistics, um, can I just one thing? I would like to move that we forward um, Mike's letter alongside it. Can we, is that direct, it's direction to staff, just That's maybe, can we just forward Mike's letter with it? Is that all right? Do I need it? Why? Okay. It's up to him to send it. Oh, for today. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, uh, folks, in terms of logistics, um, uh, I think it's usually the protocol for the chair to present uh, uh, memos or letters uh, to the council, uh, though I'm happy to defer that and hand it over to somebody else if they would prefer to do that next Tuesday. You can appoint someone to do it. You don't need a vote. Well, I'm mostly just seeing if any volunteers are going to jump out there. I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do it if you if you don't like. Do but, it then. Yeah. But not if you don't believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> He's a lawyer. He knows how to argue things he doesn't believe in. Um, <laughs> I can I can I can represent this as being the vote of the the commission. Um, I okay. believe I had to do that recently as well yeah. on Main yeah. Street. As a matter of fact, yeah, you did really something on Main great. Street. You did great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just awesome. All right. Um, Okay, uh, so back to our, our main agenda. Are there other planning commission discussion items or other future agenda items that anyone wants to bring up at this time? Seeing none, uh, great. I think that takes us to the end of our agenda. And that, uh, Commissioner Reese, any 
Nope, I'm done. Great, we're done. Yes, sir. Adjourned at 10, 16 p.m. Yep. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>